Well, welcome. I want to thank everyone here for coming in on a little bit of a rainy day to get some CE credits and to join us for Sustainable Vineyard Practices. This is our second one of the year, and I have to say it's thrilling to see everybody in a room again and seeing smiling faces and, and just having conversation again. It's so nice. So thank you all for coming and, um, and supporting what we're all here to do, which is preserve, promote, and grow some of the best grapes that we possibly can here in Napa. Um, and part of that is learning some great new things, but before we get started, I'll introduce myself. My name is Caleb Mosley. I'm the um, chair of the Member Services Committee, and I'm a board member for your Napa Valley Grape Growers. Um, there are about 20 people watching via Zoom, so hi to all you folks out there. Um, you'll have opportunities to chime in with questions um, through Emily, who is kind of manning the ship on the computer front. So she'll be able to get some questions from you, and you can chime in. She'll ask them out loud over a mic so we can all hear them at the same time. A um, couple other things that are important that you should be aware of. If you are not on the Napa Valley Grape Growers weather alert from Eric Moldstead, you should be. It was a huge little help on Monday afternoon. I got a phone call that said, hey, you might want to be ready to go for an interesting night tonight. Um, and thankfully, we were able to go out and run some of our machines, make sure everything was working fine, and it turned out to be a pretty interesting night, as I'm sure you're all aware. But if you're not on that, um, talk to anybody here at any of the Grape Grower booths. We can get you signed up. It's a members-only benefit, and I think it's something that's pretty important for actually uh, growing great grapes and keeping things safe during this fun time of the year. Um, let's see. I also want to make sure we thank our annual sponsors. You've been seeing them um, going across the screen. We can't do any of this without them. They help us put chairs together, secure sites, um, make sure that we can put on all these great seminars and help us with our, some of our investments in technology to make sure that the folks that are not here today can get some of the great content that we can too. Um, let's see. CE credits in the back. Make sure if you have a PCA license, CCA, whatever you have, um, there's a place to sign in. We do not have Scantrons anymore, so don't worry about frantically rushing to pick up a Scantron. I don't think we'll need to do that this time around, which is nice. So just sign in at the back table and you're all good for your CE credits. And let's see, with that, I want to give a big plug to Monica Cooper and um, her VitTech group, which is an outstanding resource for everyone here as well. If you haven't signed up for the VitTech group, um, it's a great way to stay up to speed on all sorts of different um, kind of very relevant things. I think there's an ant ID uh, seminar coming up in early May, so stay tuned for that. I'm sure Monica will talk about that as well. But um, we collaborate quite a bit with Dr. Cooper and VitTech and the UC group, and we're so happy to have that level of kind of collaboration and, and uh, working relationship where we can put together seminars like this, and many thanks to Monica for that. So with that, I think that's all I need to talk about. So I'll invite Monica up, and she'll talk about our speakers and get the day going. Thank you all for coming. All right, wow. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. And on behalf of Napa Vineyard Technical Group, welcome. We have cards. If you're not a member and you're interested, you think today's content is fantastic and you want to become a member, the cards are back on the bar near the coffee. Um, I won't delay too much because Caleb gave all the really relevant announcements. I'd like to welcome our first speaker, who is Dr. Kent Dana. He is a biocontrol specialist from UC Berkeley. And he's going to talk about vine mealybug because for the last 20 years, his lab has been very engaged with vine mealybug. And without the work that's come out of his lab, we wouldn't have the tools such as mating disruption and biocontrol that we really need for vine mealybugs. So let's give Kent a warm welcome and turn it over to him. Thanks, Monica. So yeah, 20 years. I was actually in Coachella when they first found this thing that wasn't grape mealybug, and we didn't know what was going on, because it looked like citrus mealybug. And Don Lavisi, Walt Bentley, the grower, we thought, what should we do? Should we just spray it? And Walt Bentley said, well, it's only five vines. Why not just pull this whole thing out? And instead, they put on Lorsban, they put on Lanate, they put on Dimethoate, they put on everything you could think of, but it just kept spreading. So let's pull my slides up. Oh. Not going. 
I can do it without slides. Not really. <laughs> Monica tells me I can't talk about conventional control tools. That's the agenda. So I have been working with this insect for about, well, actually over 20 years right now. And of the different insects I've worked on, this is one of the hardest ones to kill. Um, I'm going to go through some of the reasons why that's so, and I'm going to focus on mating disruption and biological controls and even some cultural controls in terms of what you can do with that. California is unique um, in the wine growing regions around the world. Before, well, if you went to Washington, Canada, Virginia, New York, they've got the native grape mealybug. You've got the grape mealybug, and it is a vector of leaf roll. But when I first started working on mealybugs, the grape mealybug, I had growers, um, you remember the conversation, where people would say, I don't have mealybug, but leaf roll spreading. And I said, I can find the grape mealybug in every vineyard in Napa. They're just so low in density because of the parasites, they're hard to find. Now that we've got the pheromones, where you can put out a pheromone trap, you can see the grape mealybug is fairly widespread. It was even more difficult to find once vine mealybug came in because everyone started using first Admire or Platinum and now Movento, really knocking down its numbers. But California is unique. We don't just have the grape mealybug. We've got most of the important mealybugs around the world. There's the invasive obscure mealybug from South America, the invasive long-tailed mealybug from Australia, Gill's mealybug, it's up in Placerville. And we've even got the apple mealybug, we've got the citrus phyllis mealybug. Those are big pests, citrus phyllis mealybug is a huge pest in New Zealand. It's here in California, in Southern California, and it, it could make it into the vineyards at some point in time as well. I don't have very many slides about leaf roll, but I do want to mention that the different mealybugs do vary in their ability to be vectors of leaf roll associated, grape leaf roll associated viruses. And the vine mealybug, that's Planococcus fecus, is actually one of the more efficient ones. And in part because it's just better at moving it as a crawler, but in part because it's got so many generations per year. And so there's more generations. That means there's more crawlers. Crawlers are the dispersal stage. It's a mobile stage. So that's the one that gets in the harvesting equipment, on the harvesting crew, that gets picked up by the wind and blown around. So more generations, more crawlers, more chance for movement. The reason it's got more generations is because it just feeds faster and develops faster. It's going from baby to teenager in five years instead of 16 years. Uh, this is just showing some work that Von Walton did in the lab looking at temperature development. So you can see the first little bit up there, if I were to do it here, that's, those are the eggs, first in star, second in star, adult, and oviSAC. So it goes at 67 degrees Fahrenheit from egg to egg, one generation, in about 65 days. At 86 degrees, which is about its optimal temperature, it goes from egg to egg stage, one generation, in about 33 days. Optimal temperature, it actually can develop faster at 90 degrees, but you get a lot more of them dying. So hot temperatures kill the crawlers, uh, but it can go through a generation in about 28 days. So if we plug this into a computer model, in Napa you've got four or five generations per year. It's getting worse because we're getting mild winters. There's no diapause, like a bear goes into hibernation. There's no diapause of this insect. Great mealybug has got two generations per year in Napa area, and it it, it stops its development sometime in the fall. It overwinters as a first instar or in the egg sac stage. Vine mealybug doesn't do that. And that's something to remember. If you've got, we just had, last week was a warm week, right? Um, if you've got temperatures in the 60s, um, you've got development of this mealybug. It doesn't matter if it's January or February. So you start to think 
of control when you start to see this mealybug coming out from underneath the bark on the trunk or on the cane. It actually is going through one or two generations from sometime in December to sometime in May when you start to see it going onto the leaves. And so we're not putting on very many controls at that point in time. And most, if you remember, folks here that remember the Lord's Band, that was the old program, put on a delayed dormant application of Lord's Band. It had, the old Lord's Band had a fuming action. It, it, it created a volatile. Well, that was taken away because it got picked up in the fog and moved two miles down the way to a schoolyard. But that's what was killing the mealybugs underneath the bark. And I'm gonna come back to this over and over again. That's, that's what's hard to do. So the talk today is gonna to be broken down into monitoring chemical controls. And again, I can't talk about conventional chemical controls because Monica's told me I only have three hours to speak. Um, <laughs> biological controls will spend a lot of time on mating disruption because it's, it's not as simple as putting out a dispenser. And then kind of a pitch for area-wide control programs, which is what Napa's doing better than anybody else at this point in time. So for monitoring in the past, you could go out and you could look for ants. If you saw a trail of ants going up and down the vine, you could probably find the mealybug, one of the mealybug species, or European fruit lecanium scale, another vector of leaf roll, and you've got it in Napa. You could look for dropped leaves on the ground. You could look for honeydew on the leaves. Um, and then Jocelyn Miller, working with Walt Bentley and myself, Walt said to Jocelyn, we've got this new mealybug down in Coachella, and it's moved into Del Rey, which is um, by Fresno and Ben Bakersfield. Um, and it would be nice to do something to monitor for this. So Jocelyn identified the sex pheromone. A lot of you are not using the sex pheromone to monitor for the mealybug, and you're not using it because of two reasons. First reason is that sometimes you get high counts, but it's hard to find the mealybug. Um, second reason is because I've been, told, I've been told that once you find the mealybug, the vine mealybug, you know you've got the vine mealybug. And once you know you've got the vine mealybug, you know you're gonna have to put on some kind of treatment for it. And so why should I monitor? I still like to have people use pheromone traps. Maybe not all season long, maybe just put them out during the peak flight, which is typically sometime between August and October. For some reason, that end of the season, there's either the pesticides are waning, Movento's kind of running out of steam, temperature cools, that allows the males to fly a little bit more, and it's possible this mealybug can, it can, it's, it, it's got a weird genetics, so it can change the ratio of males and females that the, that the female has in her ovisac. So usually, it's mostly females, like 99% females. But sometimes it can produce as many males as females. And we think it might be doing that during the fall to kind of have some genetic flow and exchange uh, to prepare for the next season. So we get these bigger flights uh, in August, September, October, and maybe just put out the pheromone traps there and get a historical record. So this year I did mating disruption and I had no flight until October. Um, I put the dispensers out a little bit earlier and I had a flight in September and October. So think about using it as a historical record. And I know too that there's some vineyards where you're getting very good control and you're getting these counts of two or three or four. And it's really hard when you get low counts, especially at the end of the season, to correlate, to even find the millibuck in your vineyard. Uh, but still, as a historical record, it's, it's nice to have those counts. Here's the problem with the vine millibug. Um, it's got these physical refuges. Even the grape millibug does. But the grape millibug will expose itself at different times of the year. Um, so you think of it like this, and this is the wrong way to think about it. Uh, millibug is spending the winter and early spring someplace under the bark on the trunk. Uh, in the springtime, it starts to move towards the canes. You're still not seeing it, but it's going through those one or two generations. 
Uh, early summer, it starts to move on the leaves, and it depends on where you are. So in Fresno, sometimes we don't see it until late June, early July on the leaves. In other places, it might be May or June. And then, of course, summer and fall, it moves into the fruit. So when you think about it this way, it seems like the mealybug population is moving from section to section of the vine, I mean, in mass, as a population. It doesn't really do it that way. So what we did, and this work was done in Coachella and Fresno, because when we did this work, you didn't have the vine mealybug yet. This is before it was even found in Napa, before the Napa eradication program. I'll just show you the Fresno data. Coachella was a little bit different. Napa's going to be a little bit different. But the take-home message is the same. What we did is we spent about five minutes on every section of the vine. It took about 30 to 40 minutes per vine. And we recorded all the mealybugs on those sections. And we did this every two weeks throughout the season and once a month during the winter time. And we produced figures or graphs that look kind of like this. Um, this is just during the growing season, but we've got it all year. So trust me, during the winter, it's underneath the bark on the trunk, the canes, the roots. I put in color the exposed areas. So the great bunch, the leaves, the new canes, the old canes, that when you're scouting, you see. That's when, okay, there's the mealybug, it's on the leaf, it's exposed. I put in black and white shades, mealybug that's in a hidden location, a refuge. So if we remove right now all of those exposed mealybugs, you see that, that there's a, always a portion of the population which is hidden, which is out of reach for most of your natural enemies. And for a lot of our materials, our insecticides, the contact materials really don't do very well here. And your systemic materials tend to go where the vine is sending its nutrients. So they tend to go to the leaves. They tend to, it's a sink source deal. And that's what we found with Movento. I'm assuming that's what happens with Admire too. So there's always a portion of the mealybug population which is hard to kill because it's in this protected location. Um, and you see this, the first slide on your left, um, that's a, 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 a cordon here, I think in um, the Napa area where I'm pulling off the bark. You can see the leaves in the background. Um, it's about this time of the year. And you've got all of these, there's gotta be 40 adult female mealybug in that picture. Uh, the middle picture is just a cane, uh, pulling back a little bit of the bark on the cane. And you can see there's 20 mealybugs there, all fairly late stage, ready to have crawlers. And then we see that messy trunk that is an indication that there's got to be hundreds of mealybugs underneath that. There are cultural practices you can do to try to expose this population. You can strip the bark. Uh, that's a picture from Argentina where they were stripping the bark, very labor intensive. Um, people have used high pressure water to pull that off. I'm not sure what happens long term when you strip the bark off of a vine, if it doesn't open this up for more diseases, for scarring, for other issues. Uh, we did tanglefoot. We put tanglefoot around the base of the trunk. And that's what that graph shows, is that with a tanglefoot barrier between the trunk and the leaves, you have less uh, mealybugs uh, on the, the grape clusters on the leaves, but it's also very labor intensive. And in fact, if anyone wants to do this, the picture here is showing someone doing it with a spatula, like a painting spatula. The way to really do this as cheap as possible is just to give up that your clothes are not gonna get covered in stickum. Go out and get some of those rubber gloves, the really thick, thick hard ones, uh, five gallon bucket of Tanglefoot and put your hand in the bucket of Tanglefoot and just smear it around with your hand. Um, and it is gonna be messy, but that's the cheapest way to do this. Again, I can't talk about conventional insecticides, but just uh, briefly, uh, dark circle, control, open circle, Movento. Movento's been our best product to date. Please don't overuse it because it might be developing resistance. 
We're testing other materials like Savanto. This is Savanto as a drip. Uh, remove Movento, put on Savanto as a foliar, just to show you that the same product uses a drip versus a foliar, gave us different outcomes. And our results down in Fresno are gonna be different than your results in Napa. So be your own researcher. Um, and again, we've had Movento break down. This is a study in Lodi, California, and you can see control, belay, applaud, assail, and Movento, um, plus everything got a blanket application of belay. And Movento did not wipe out the millibug. It was still there. Um, we've been looking at resistance. Uh, the bottom graph shows an organic population, which was our control, and then a population from the Central Coast and Lodi Woodbridge that had Movento applications for many years and the growers reported it wasn't working as well. And on potted vines with really you know, uh, good coverage, at four ounces per acre, we were starting to see a little bit of mealybug survival. And so we're gonna test it now at two ounces per acre. And what one of the uh, guys in the lab, Thomas Martin did, we did this study with surfactants. And we wanted to look to see if there's any surfactant that made a difference. None of them made a difference with Movento. But what he pointed out was there was a difference in the amount of enol between Napa, Sonoma, or Napa, Bakersfield, Sacramento, and Lodi. And he wondered what was going on. Enol is the stuff that kills the mealybug. Spirotetramat is your active ingredient. You spray it on the vine. It goes into the leaf, gets metabolized to spirotetramat enol. The spirotetramat enol is what kills the mealybug. And he just looked at the humidity on the day he made these applications. And so this is relative humidity, and sure enough, the amount of enol from Bakersfield to Lodi to Napa to SLO, San Luis Obispo, uh, increased when we had higher relative humidity on the day of the spray. We don't know if this means anything, if this was just a quirky uh, relationship, but it's possible that if you're spraying and it's 100 degrees outside and that material evapor that evaporates very quickly, uh, dries up very quickly, that there's not time for it to get into the leaf and get metabolized into spirotetramat enol. But I'm supposed to focus on organic materials, and so here's a number of the common types of OMRI materials that are registered. And over the last 15 years, I've, I've tested them all. I'm gonna point something out. The neem that I tested 15 years ago is not the neem that you buy today. The Grandivo that I tested six years ago is not the Grandivo you get today because these are biologicals and oftentimes the formulations change. And I say that just as a note because many of the companies producing that will tell me that you know, your data is out of date now after four or five years. But, so, um, some of the issues I've got with these materials is that there's very little residual. It doesn't stay for a long period of time. That means you have to put it out probably every 10 to 12 days or every 14 days uh, to make it kill the millibuck because it disappears. It almost always targets the smaller stages. The bigger stages have a lot more wax. Uh, just think about any liquid going on to a waxy surface, the liquid rolls off. These are contact materials. So the smaller stages have greater surface area to uh, size, volume, and they have less wax, and they're more mobile, and the bottom side of them doesn't have wax, and so if a crawler's walking everywhere and goes across Piganic, it, it has a better chance of picking that up and dying. And they're broad spectrum. Typically, these things are broad spectrum, and so if someone here just got a shipment of anagyrus and they're thinking, I'm gonna put those parasites out and then help them out by putting on some Pyganic, Pyganic's broad spectrum. So they'll kill your natural enemies. And I'll come back to that next. So can they kill the mealybug? This is a pumpkin trial, right? So we infest these, I'm actually, I'm going to be long. I just looked at the clock. So I'll speed this up. So we infest these pumpkins with vine mealybug. 
Uh, that's Glenn, he goes out there, we get the right formulation, we put it in these little squirt bottles, and we spray the pumpkins with Pyganic, we spray it with Grandiva, we spray it with Lanate. Uh, he's all dressed up, so he's probably spraying it with something like Lanate right now. No longer registered, we lost it. Um, so this is better than you can do in the field. This is like 500 gallons to the acre rate with direct contact. Um, and we're looking at things like LD50s and LD99s. So when we do that, what do we find? Uh, don't worry about the different products, but we're using some things. This, this was done 15 years ago. We still had Lanate and Lohr's band registered. So in figure A, that's the harsh materials, dimethoate, Lanate, Lohr's band versus a water control. I just put up there the LD50s, and what you see is that at day zero, we spray these things, we go back out five hours later, and almost everything is dead. Uh, and then I pointed out E, which is some of the more common organic materials. E-Control, JMS Stylet Oil, which at the time was something I really liked a lot, uh, Safety Side, and Water. And I've got a Nemex Pyganic and Water at F. Um, so each one of those, instead of having everything on one graph, which got, which got confusing, I separate these out into different types of products. The, the take home message is that most of these organic products would kill the vine mealybug. It took them a little bit longer. So you see in that E, we were getting an LD50 on about day eight. Whereas with the Lanate and Lord's Man, it was immediate. So they'll, they'll kill the mealybug in this not real kind of pumpkin trial. So, I have on a number of times tried to do this in the field. Uh, the last two years was our largest trial. Um, Bronco Vineyards really wanted to, to move more towards organic. And the um, Bronco Fresno State endowed position, Luca Brilliante, was tasked with looking at organic products. So he asked uh, if I could work on this with him. And we had a Fresno, uh, county vineyard where we had large one acre plots, uh, field applied materials, and you can see the materials we had tried in 2020, Agdeside, Azagard, Grandivo, and Pyganic. We flipped it around in 2021, but the results were pretty much the same. Uh, we had very few millibugs on the leaf because we were spraying about every two weeks, uh, four sprays throughout the season just showing you a July versus an August sample. Take home message is that the control was the same uh, as all of these treatments. Uh, we got a little bit better in this one with Agdeside and Azagard. Uh, they did a little bit better than Pyganic, which in most of our pumpkin trials, Pyganic was one of the better products. So um, what do I think was happening here? Um, I think that we were killing the parasites because the control, we could see a lot of parasitism uh, in this vineyard, especially on the leaves. And so you have to think of how you're using these materials. If you're going to put on any insecticide and it's uh, broad spectrum, then consider what your parasitism level is. Consider if you're releasing the cryptolamus or something else. Because I think that's why we ended up with, with a uh, pretty much the same. So how do I explain uh, this whole broad spectrum thing? This is work that came out. This was published in Nature. I've never had a Nature publication. And they got this Nature publication doing something that to me was so obvious, I never would have attempted to publish this in Nature. Basically they said, if you're a broad spectrum insecticide, you've got less natural enemies. So the more the insecticide kills, the greater the impact it has on natural enemies. So let's see what this means with our selective materials. Um, this is work that I, I borrowed from a group working in um, walnuts, apples, and pears. It was a Washington and California team project, and they looked at a number of different materials or categories of materials with a lot of different parasitoids, one group, and predators, another group. So when you look at pyrethroids, in general, pyrethroids are bad against both the parasites 
and the predators. And so that's got a downstream impact because then you've got a secondary outbreak or primary pest outbreak because you're killing off the natural enemies. Spinosins tended to be okay on the predators, but tended to be bad against the parasitoids. And I remember when Entrust first came out, they had a Volkswagen Beetle, and they had it all colored up with Entrust on the side, and they said it was you know, very soft on natural enemies. It's, it's easier on the beetles, but it still is pretty harsh on the parasitoids. Neonicotinoids. This mostly you're talking about the contact materials. Tends to be hard against both predators and parasitoids. Admire, not so much, but there was some question when you're broadcast spraying admire and you've got a cover crop, if it doesn't get incorporated in your cover crop's nectaries and then get picked up by your natural enemies feeding on the nectary so that they can produce more offspring. I didn't show that work, but that has been shown in other systems. The neonic admirer, when it goes in, or platinum, um, or any of the others that go in through the drip system, is less likely to have any impact on natural enemies because the grape really doesn't have a lot of nectaries. And so you don't have a lot of natural enemies feeding on nectar coming out of the grape. And strangely enough, spirotetramat tended to be soft on both. And that's because it goes out as spirotetramat, which doesn't really kill anything, and doesn't kill anything until it gets metabolized in the grapevine to spirotetramat enol. And then it's in the grapevine. And so it has to be something feeding on the grapevine that has an impact. Now, one of the things I always wanted to do, but have not done yet, is to see if, you know, you always have that spirotetramat getting a little bit lower in um, parts per million in the vine from the day you spray it. It starts to go from somewhere around five or 10 parts per million down to parts per billion. Can it get to a level where it's not killing the mealybug, but you've got spirotetramat enol in the mealybug, and the parasite is in the mealybug, and it kills the parasite? I don't know, but that's something we still want to study in the future. Um, something we haven't studied yet is the sublethal effects of these uh, different products as well. We always think about the acute effects. Basically, is it killing the the pest is a killing the natural enemy fast. Um, one of the things the Washington, California group did is they looked at the sublethal effects of all these products and they found that there, there were a number of sublethal effects where the parasite wasn't dying, but instead of killing you know, 100, nat 100 pests, its fecundity was lowered down to about 20, or its longevity was shorter, which meant it had less time to kill things. Okay, biocontrols. Lots of predators out there. Um, you can buy green lacewings. You can buy mealybug destroyer. Please learn to tell the difference between the mealybug destroyer in your upper right with the larva versus your native mealybug destroyer-like beetles. Uh, in the lower right, that's a skimness. You can see it, it has got a little bit of a red dot on its butt whereas the Cryptolamus has a red thoracic shield up front or orange, uh, you've got a lot of the mealybug destroyer and a lot of these native beetles here anyway. And one of the things we saw in the past was that people would purchase and release some of these predators, like green lacewing, and then see a lot of green lacewing and feel like my releases were effective. So have a control area, have a no release area, and compare the natural enemies in both the release and the no release to see if you're getting a bang for your buck. The nice thing about releasing green lace wings is that they tend to be resistant to a lot of the insecticides you're using. It's one of the most resistant of the natural enemies, especially compared to the parasitoids. Um, how many people know what that little orange thing is? the most photogenic of the little natural enemies. 
That is the larva of a sesodomyid midge. You can barely make out at the tip, see if I can do this right there, it's kind of brownish mouth parts. It just slowly sneaks up on those millibugs and snuggles in like it's a millibug, take its mouth, takes its mouth part and sticks it into a millibug and you can see it increase in size. You can see it just filling its stomach up with the millibug juice and then it goes over and it, it, it kills another one. So it's a sesodomyid midge. You can't purchase them. It will, it will be in your vineyard. The downside of all of these predators is they tend to be in your vineyard when you've got a lot of millibug. They tend to leave your vineyard when the millibug density gets low. And you want the millibug density to get low. So for example, the millibug destroyer adult that you're purchasing is looking for a lot of millibugs to lay her eggs into. Because as a first instar, they're so tiny they can barely make it from one side of the vine to the other, let alone across the vine row or 10 vines down to find a millibug. So if there's really very few millibugs, she is going to fly to another vineyard where she can find millibugs. The lacewing adult is attracted to honeydew. She feeds on the honeydew and that helps her produce more eggs. And she also is gonna lay, lay her eggs near a source of millibugs. So these predators are in great numbers when you've got a lot of millibugs and their density goes down when you've got few millibugs. Um, that's why I like the parasites a little bit better at lower densities. The parasites tend to work better at lower, de lower millibug densities than the predators do. Uh, the large picture is Anagyrus pseudococci. I'll talk about that next. In the lower right, that's the male Anagyrus. In the upper right, that's a female, because they're all female, they're poly, polyembryonic, there we go. Um, that is Coxidoxinoides peregrinus. Um, so the upper right is a little black parasitoid it's in your vineyards, but it's very hard to document that it's there because it, cause, it attacks the first and second instar and causes them to drop off the vine and it pupates down in the soil. The anagyrus, uh, male and female, the millibug stays on the leaf and it produces this mummy that you've seen, kind of puffs it up. It looks not quite as waxy because as the millibug's dying, um, it's not producing as much wax, and so you can kind of tell a puffed up mummified millibug. Learn how to identify that, because that tells you that your augmentation is actually, your release is having some impact. So learn how to do that. Now, um, these parasites, the antigyrus does have some limitations. So what we see here in this graph is that we exposed, I should be doing this, the black versus the gray, so the black versus the gray. We exposed vine millibug to the anagyrus in November, December, January, February, March, April. So we exposed these different batches. We then took half of them into the insectary and we left half outside in Fresno. The stuff we left outside didn't emerge until May. The stuff we took inside took about three weeks and the adult emerged. And I thought, well, this insect has got, the, the parasite has a biology that it's not gonna come out until the millibug is coming out from underneath the bark. That allows it to survive because it comes out too early, it can't find the millibug and it, it doesn't do well. So what that means is that you've got kind of a delay. We're starting to see parasitism begin in June. Millibugs already had two generations by that time. So you get 80% parasitism at the end of the season, but it's at the end of the season. And also notice that these are exposed millibugs. These are millibugs underneath the bark. Underneath the bark, very low percent parasitism. So it, it has these two things that lower its effectiveness. Um, so I talked about this before. One of the things if I could end my career with something would be figuring out how to kill the millibug underneath the bark because that protects it from the insecticides and the natural enemies as well. 
What we've got in Fresno is this other type of refuge. This is a coxid moth, a carpenter worm. So we see right here, that's the moth larva. These are mealybugs, that's the ant. So again, that's the moth larva, moth larva. And every time we find one of these burrows, there are mealybugs inside there. And I've never yet found one of these mealybugs parasitized. This is, I've already pulled the bark away. And you can see the adult right there. It's got this little Nike stripe on it, a really kind of Nike stripe, a really uh, cute looking moth. So it's in Fresno County. It's a new association. No one ever found it on vines before. No one ever knew where this thing came from. Start looking for that. When you're pulling back the bark, looking for the mealybug, look to see if you've got this little board out area as well, because this is a new association with the vine mealybug, and it's only going to make the situation worse here. And of course, you've got ants that tend the mealybug and lower percent parasitism. That's why Monica developed ant controls, which I'm not going to talk about today in the interest of time. But those middle graphs, that's about six inches underneath the ground, more so in Fresno than in Napa, but um, they can help the mealybugs survive on the roots where nothing really kills them. Um, I mentioned Anagyrus pseudococci. You might hear some insectaries talk about they're selling Anagyrus vladimiri. You've got both Anagyrus pseudococci and Anagyrus vladimiri. You've always had both. What we imported years ago was one of the two. We don't know which. We're going to try to follow up on that right now. But what happened was that when we imported it, we worked with Sergei Trapitsin at Riverside. And we said, this thing we got in Spain is attacking the second instar millibub. Whereas what we've got in California attacks the third and adult millibug. And he says, oh, something's different with these. And I cannot tell them apart. You've got to use molecular tools. Uh, he's got some things he's found on the antenna and the genitalia that he thinks you can tell these apart with. But we're going to do a survey in the next couple of years so we know what we've got, so that we can compare what you guys are releasing. The main important part is that some of the insectaries in Europe are having a hard time bringing in Vladimiri. Even though it's the same thing, it's a new species, and the rules, the regulations have not been worked out for it. Um, we've looked at nematodes. It has to have moisture in the soil. It has not worked for us. Maybe it works for you in Napa. Um, we're going to look at releasing these natural enemies via drone this next year because it's popular. I'm a little bit pessimistic, but um, we're going to give it a shot and see how it goes. It would be great if it works and you can have a program set up where you know uh, through uh, GIS pinpointing where the millibug is and you program the drone to release the natural enemies in that area. So that would be really cool. Mating disruption is how I'm going to end. So Monica, I'm, I'm getting back on time. Um, so this is just my intro to mating disruption. That's an adult male mealybug. And that's a tiny, tiny sliver of a pheromone lure. And you can kind of see over here in the corner that little pink body up there is a female mealybug. That adult male mealybug spent hours trying to mate with this little sliver of the pheromone lure. It ignored the female. We tried this over and over again. It ignored the female forever. At one point, she went over to him and knocked herself into him. And it kind of said, OK, I recognize you, but then immediately went back to the pheromone lure. So that's how mating disruption works. There's always this theoretical question, is the male flying around going after false signals, or is it going catatonic, where it doesn't know which way to go, and so it, it can't find anything, so it just sits on a leaf. And this kind of suggests what the data suggests, is that it's going to spend its time going after these false signals. Um, we've tested a lot of the, what well, we've tested most of the different uh, dispenser types. So they can be passive dispensers, like the Sutera Checkmate, um, plastic dispenser, like the Pacific Biocontrol Isomate Rope. It can be a sprayable solution, like the Sutera Flowable uh, solution. It can be an aerosol device. I think somebody else has one of those right now. We tested the puffers that were created at that time by Sutera be great to test the Semios product. 
one day as well. I like all the products, okay? But you have to remember that all the, all the products have got pros and cons, and a lot of times you're misusing the product. So here's how we used to show a mating disruption data. You've got your mating disruption plots that have got different replicates flatlined out. We oftentimes say that that's trap shutdown, which is a poor way to describe it. We've got uh, our control, Movento applied. Movento helped kept the control down. Towards the fall, Movento's kind of losing its impact. There's a recovery in the fall, but main disruption is flatlined the entire way. Let's look at the entire plot instead of doing the whole replication thing. So we can see here in yellow is the control and red is the mating disruption. That's an 80 acre block with eight individual plots. The graph down below is showing you where the wind direction is coming from. So it's going from the northwest to the southeast. And we can see at the beginning of the trial, we had a larger mealybug population over on the west. And it was there throughout. So that's before mating disruption starts. First year, at the end of the season, we now have controlled the mealybug except for upwind control. This control's got some, this control's got some. So in our control, we're still getting some, but we're getting this benefit of mating disruption in these controls because the wind is blowing our pheromone into the control. Beginning of the season, this was the hot spot but the wind is blowing our mating disruption into the control. Upwind, this control is still a hot spot, right? Also, these plots are rectangular. And so in this site right here, where we're getting less impact, it's upwind. So if you've got a tiny vineyard and it's rectangular and the wind's pretty strong, you're in Carneros, mating disruption's not going to give you as much help unless you get your neighbor to do mating disruption because the wind is blowing the pheromone away. Um, the other take home message from this, this is the second year. So in the beginning of the year in the top graph, we still have the hot spot, but the rest of the plot is pretty clean. End of the season is the exact same thing. We, we still have this hot spot upwind. In almost all the studies we've ever done, you get more control year after year after year of using mating disruption. And this is just the, the damage we had uh, looking at cluster ratings, and it was kind of the same pattern um, that we saw before. Um, and one of the things to think about is that if you're using sprayable formulations or plastic dispensers, you need to have coverage at the end of the season. Uh, this is kind of a heat map, and what we did here is this, this is one square mile in Fresno, if it is a, a color other than um, black, that is a vineyard, usually raisin vineyards. Our red is our mating disruption, our white is our control, and you can see through the heat map the hot spots. So in the beginning of the year, that's a hot spot up there, hot spot up there, and you just kind of follow it from July, August, September to October, and you can see in the red, the mating disruption was kind of keeping the mealybug density low but you can see when mating disruption wore out. These were all the plastic dispensers. And by October and September, we're starting to get a little bit of a blowout starting to happen again. So I'm gonna show that in a different way. What we've got here is a sprayable going out, and the sprayable is going out uh, early and mid-season or early, mid, and late season. And uh, you can see here that we have flatlined out when we're putting the sprayable on early, mid, and late. But when we put it on only early and mid-season, the open circles, we started to get recovery in September and October. And that did show itself having an impact in our millibug counts as well, with lower, when we had lower counts, when we had full season, season coverage. Um, that was repeated again this year in Lodi Woodbridge. The first last graph was from Fresno. Uh, this is work that Nathan uh, Mercer in my lab just completed. And we can see here an early spray versus a late spray versus no spray. 
So early gave us coverage that lasted pretty much throughout the season, and late, you can see the population going down after that coverage. So what we want to find out um, is how long the sprayable is lasting in terms of coverage, and my guess is that what you want to do is go for full season coverage or focus on when the millibug is having its larger flight, which is at the end of the season. On one note, one thing good about the puffers is that they can be programmed. So they can be programmed to when you're saying the flight happened. One good thing about the sprayable is you can put it out when you desire to. One bad thing is that you guys don't tend to put it out at the end of the season because your powdery mildew sprays are done and you're tank mixing this. And so you tend to say, okay, I'm now in harvest mode. One good thing about the Pacific Biocontrol isomate rope is that we were getting about six or seven months activity of that product. Uh, the Sutera Checkmate plastic dispenser was getting about four, sometimes five months, depending on the temperature. Monica, I will go faster. So one of the things to get you guys to use mating disruption, I know it's got a, a cost to it, especially at full label rate. Uh, this is work we did with Monica in San Luis Obispo back in the day. I should have changed that from hectares to acres, but the highest rate is 250 dispensers per acre. Then it goes, the next highest rate was about 190, then about 120, then about 90. A take home message here was that we were getting an impact with these dispensers down to all the way about 125 dispensers per acre. That is below label rate. So you're going off label if you do that. But consider if you've got very, very low millibugs and you, you can't find a millibug, but you want to be proactive, maybe putting out 60, 90 dispensers per acre will keep any millibug from getting inside there. Um, and this graph, since I am now at my time, um, is just showing you the difference of damage between those rates from the low, 125 per hectare to the high, 615 per hectare, or about 90 to about 250. And A, B, and C are the first, second, and third year of this trial. And you can kind of follow the progression of either the vine infestation or the fruit damage. And what you see is that looking just at fruit damage, for example, uh, the first year, no real difference. Second year, at the highest rate, we were now getting significant reduction in fruit damage. And the third year, even at the lowest rate, we were getting, at the second lowest rate, which is 125, we were getting significant reduction of fruit damage. So two things, it does work at lower rates, it works better at higher rates, and it works better year after year after year. So once you start it, don't give it up. And don't use mating disruption because, man, I just found a huge number of mealybugs. I've got to hit this with everything, but I'm not going to use insecticides. No, you've got to combine this with insecticides to drive it down, and then mating disruption and natural enemies keep it down at a lower level. Um, and again, Pacific Biocontrol Lure, perhaps because it lasts for a longer time. This is full season coverage in the control at 25 dispensers per acre, no significant impact. But starting at 50 dispensers per acre with this lure, we were getting a significant reduction in millibug density. Uh, Tracy is looking at putting out a meso dispenser. Uh, it's a really large thing, it's hard to put out. Um, it doesn't work well with mechanical harvesters, so we're trying to get around that. But we were down at, at 35 dispensers per acre. This is a help, not so much because of cost of the material, but because of deployment costs. You're not walking up every single row and down every single row. Uh, we did look at aerosol devices. Um, you can see in the upper graphs, uh, all of those upper graphs, this is the, the puffer, because it's a Sutera product, puffer on, and you can see in this heat map around the little blue circle, less mealybug going out. Uh, in the bottom graphs, that's puffer off, so basically we just turned it off and on, and you can see from the heat map more millibugs. Take home message for us with this is that when we worked out with some math, the formulation, it looked like we had to use something like 10 
puffers per acre, which we thought was, was maybe a little bit too much. It would be great to work with Semios and see if, if they've got it down to lower numbers. Uh, and this work now is, is dated. This was um, 15 years ago. Um, for Semios, again, one of the nice things about puffers is that they can time when the material is going to go out. This is just looking at temperature and looking at flight time. And so the mealybugs don't fly when it's hot. They don't fly when it's cold. Uh, they like that mid-temperature range, 66 to 85. And this is looking at the time of the day. Uh, they fly from 5 a.m. to about 11 a.m., 10 a.m. And that's it. They don't fly in the hot part of the day, uh, probably to conserve their energy. And one other factor about mating disruption, and this is a, a, it was supposed to be one trial where we had five different table grapes. Each one was a replicate. And we got a significant overall impact of mating disruption. But when I pulled it out by replicate, uh, you can see from the left to the right, that first site, flame one, um, no impact of mating disruption, but they had a huge millibug density. Mating disruption on its own doesn't work when the millibug density is really high because the millibugs are clumped and the male comes out and it can mate with a female that's just two millimeters away from it. Second site, uh, flame two, a little bit. Flame three, we had no millibugs. The grower thought they had some, we couldn't discover any. This is where maybe you shouldn't be doing the costs of mating disruption at full label rate. Maybe monitor and know your density of millibug and perhaps adjust your rate of pheromone to your density of millibug. So really only in one of the five sites, and that was flame four, was there a significant difference. So you've got all these control tools that you can use to help kill the millibug. Oftentimes, the standard program is something like a neonic and spirotetramat and no augmentation, maybe sprayable, uh, flowable, mating disruption, uh, May, June, and July. I know that's what a lot of you do. Um, and proper vine management. Uh, others might be organic, putting on a lot of OMRI-approved material, purchasing and releasing natural enemies, and putting out one of the passive dispensers. Uh, the sprayable is not yet registered for organic because of the encapsulated formulation. Each of these tools have a cost. And one of the things we've noticed is that as growers are trying to save money, they're pulling out the mating disruption. So what we've been trying to do, and what I've just relayed to you, is looking at ways to reduce cost of mating disruption by saying if we can make it effective at reduced deployment rates, I think we can. Uh, think about the product you're buying because they have got uh, each of them pros and cons. Um, I think also an area-wide program, you're so much better off. If you're a, a five-acre vineyard, um, mating disruption may be helping your downwind neighbor as much as it's helping you. Uh, better deployment times, really think about when that millibug is flying end of the season. Uh, we still don't understand what happens if you have mating disruption out early combined with a low, low millibug density if you can wipe it out for the full year. But most of the sites we work in have millibug so that we can count them. We haven't been working in sites with almost no millibug yet. And again, repeated annual applications of the pheromone help. So take home message, millibug are on the trunk, underneath the bark, that's the population I have a hard time killing. There's conventional materials, which I haven't really talked about. There's armory materials. They're broad spectrum. So think about their use with your natural enemies. They have a short residual. So you have to use repeated applications and they kill the smaller stages. We're trying to look at these different combinations of mating disruption and natural enemies to make the thing best. And we're looking for resistance to Movento. Um, Overall, mating disruption, I'm pushing it a lot because I think you're gonna get resistance to momentum. And there's never been anywhere uh, documented resistance to mating disruption. To reduce cost, we're looking at reduced deployment rates, but I emphasize you're going below label rate. 
So if it doesn't work and you go back to the industry and say, oh, I used five dispensers per acre and nothing happened except millibugs got damaged, well, you're out of luck. Okay, and natural enemies, I think, play a great role. That's how I started with this. I'm way over time. No, I'm five minutes over time. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. So, um, we have some time for questions. So, uh, thanks. And my last name has got it. two A's in it, so you can always email me questions too, and just remind me of where you heard the talk. Uh, Kent, two questions. Um, it seems like there would be, based on what you're saying, benefit to almost a year-round mating disruption program, whether that's with hangers or flowable. And then second, is there potential benefits to using cryptolamus like post-harvest and trying to do something like that if you're Good, strictly both. organic, let's say, yeah. and you have no other options? Yeah, both are excellent questions. So in working closely with Tracy this last year and uh, folks that are manufacturing the product for Pacific Biocontrol, I asked about a lure that could last for the entire year. And they said, yeah, we definitely could do that. So then I asked about a lure that could last for two years. And they said, yeah, we probably can do that, but we won't do that because our, our costs, our profits are in you know, getting people to use this annually. And we don't wanna have these cycles where our production is, is off base year after year. So the um, Tracy and Pacific Biocontrol are the ones that seem like they could last the longest where you could put it out. We're gonna to try to put the Tracy lure out um, this month. And we're, what we do each time is we take lures off each month and we send them back to the manufacturer and they are able to see how much pheromone is left in those lures. For Pacific Biocontrol, it lasted for about six and a half months. So April, May, June, July, August, September. So not quite the full season. Um, so we're, they're trying to change that design. Um, so excellent question. The second one was about releasing cryptolamus. So I think that most of these natural enemy releases really are about the next year anyway. I think you have to consider natural enemies as an annual release as well. And that's because the number of generations, you saw the anagyrus graphs that I showed it starts off really low in the season. In, in May is when we're starting to get parasitism because they don't do well with the mealybug under the bark. Now, Cryptolamus does a little bit better than Anagyrus underneath the bark. So at the end of the season, your, your Movento's running out, your admirer is definitely gone. So when you're releasing natural enemies at the end of the season, um, you're not impacting your harvest period. Uh, they're not going to be as impacted of, by a tractor going down the road. They'll just move around. Um, and hopefully they overwinter. The aspect about Cryptolamus compared to Skimnus, which is the native species, is that Cryptolamus tends to not overwinter as well um, as the Skimnus, but our winters tend to not be as cold as they used to be either. So. I'm seeing more cryptolamus uh, than I have in the past, especially in San Luis Obispo. Not as much in, in and I don't work in Lode as much as I used to, so maybe Monica's seeing more. Um, yes, question down here. Yeah, I just had a question in regards to, you know, we're looking at some of your charts and your graphs as far as uh, starting the checkmate disruption earlier on in the season. Do you think that, I mean, on your graph it showed, I think, April as the earliest, but do you think that we need to be starting that even earlier with the warmer winters? Uh, I know that we personally put out our first spray back in March. Yeah. And so just curious if, you know, maybe this is something that we need to lower our rates and do with every spray at the start of the fungicide season. So you're using the flowable formulation? Correct. Yeah. Um, so the, the, I, I mentioned all these products have pros and cons. One of the things I like about the flowable is that it can get into the nooks and crannies of the bark. And you saw that video, so maybe the males that come out are going to spend, you know, if you 
put out a dispenser and it's every third vine or fifth vine, uh, maybe the mail doesn't, underneath the bark doesn't orient towards that, maybe it doesn't fly towards that. Whereas with the sprayable, maybe that male is going to be two inches away from the female and spend all of its time on a small molecule of the sprayable. Um, and that's the, that's the population we have a hard time, is killing that mealybug underneath the, the bark. So if you do start earlier, then you have to make the decision, are you going to go to six sprays during that year? Um, those initial sprays, the, the encapsulated formulation um, breaks down in part because of heat and sunlight. So uh, in April, you've got less foliage above, so you've got more sunlight, but it's cooler, so you've got less heat. So it's possible that you'll be able to go for six weeks. Um, what um, Chris Storm, who some of you know, suggests, we were trying to work out the time that, that the sprayable lasts, and he just says, I put out a pheromone trap, and as soon as I start catching males again, I know it's time to spray again. Um, the downside of that is that there's a, a delay in reaction. If you're a large grower, you've got a lot of land to cover, and all of a sudden you see a trap with mealybugs, it might be a week or more to schedule getting a tractor back in there, and then you've had a period of time where there can be some mating. Um, but I, I, I think one of the keys is that end of the season. Um, so if you start early, don't give up on using the material late. Yes, Katie. How does mating disruption influence the A great question. Um, so we've got this kind Can you of. Repeat that. Uh, the question is, how does anagyrus um, impact? How does mating disruption impact the effectiveness of anagyrus? So we showed long ago with Von Walton when we first started this that we capture anagyrus in the pheromone traps. And then we had a colleague in Israel um, state for the citrus mealybug, the same anagyrus, anagyrus pseudococci, um, was in higher densities in vineyards that had mating disruption. So we know that the parasite orients to the mealybug in part by the pheromone. Um, we think what might happen is that the parasite doesn't really like to go underneath the bark. It's got this behavior where it will raise its wings up when it's going to oviposit. And that behavior doesn't work well when you're in a tight space. Um, but when you've got mating disruption and the parasite is pretty sure there's a mealybug someplace here, uh, it spends more time searching. It doesn't give up. And without mating disruption, it might give up and go to your neighbors uh, where there's more mealybug. So we think it, it changes its searching behavior to being a little bit more hyper, um, a little bit more focused on staying in that area. And that's where I think the sprayable might be better than the dispenser because you don't want all your parasites to be hanging around a plastic dispenser and the sprayable would be on the trunk and they would be hanging around on the trunk on the leaves trying to find the mealybugs there. We've got one question from our online audience. Are there any natural enemies for vine mealybugs that are protected in the soil that are worth looking into? Yeah, great question. So um, what's going on in the soil? Um, we looked at nematodes, and that was really a trunk and soil application method with the hope of killing mealybugs. Um, in Fresno, they're not really on the roots as much as they are in Bakersfield, but you can find them one inch underground. So they're on the trunk, but you just kind of pull away a little bit of the dirt, and that's where you find the mealybug. So we were putting the nematodes there. Um, we, we didn't get any impact of, of that. Uh, you've got all kinds of ground predators, but it's, a, you know, the ground population of the mealybug is a small portion of the overall population. Um, even things like earwigs might possibly kill them, but we have not studied that in any detail. Great. Thank you again okay, for the thanks. comprehensive review. Thanks. Thank you, Kent. I know we could probably ask 
kind of questions all day. Maybe we should. I can just, you know, give up my speaking slot here. So I will introduce self-introduction. Monica Cooper, Farm Advisor, Viticulture in Napa County since 2009. Just want to kind of elaborate on some of the things that Kent talked about this morning. Then also maybe scare you a little bit, don't want to, but the reality is that vine mealybug is spreading and it's spreading quite a bit in Napa. There are many places where we didn't have it five years ago and it is now. And so if you are lucky enough that you're not farming with vine mealybug, you should be very aware because it's, it's definitely moving. Um, so Kent did a great job of you know, introducing for us why vine mealybug is so challenging to manage. We have these large populations, we have overlapping generations. When we have a warm winter, they just, you know, keep developing all winter. So some of the worst years for vine mealybug are those following a warm and dry winter because you know, even a month ago, well, two, in February, we were catching males, we were starting to see overlapping generations already, and yet a lot of the times when we think about when we're implementing our control programs, we're not really thinking about that until May or June. Well, that means that you've already had one or two generations. So um, they can be difficult to scout for and to identify um, as well, so, okay. And we have this challenge, so historically, the way vine mealybug got to a lot of different places in California were on dormant cuttings, which were being you know, inspected and heavily treated for glassing sharpshooter, but which, you know, vine mealybug was totally off the radar. So some people were lucky enough to plant vine mealybug along with their vines. I'm sorry about that. Somebody planted them at the end of every single row throughout a vineyard block. Um, and so uh, David Haviland and Kent worked on some hot water dips that is done, are done on dormant material in the nurseries. That's really helped um, with that spread. However, people started planting green growing vines. Well, so about five years ago, Lucia and I started finding, so that's Lucia Barella, who was the IPM advisor in Sonoma, in the North Coast. And uh, we started finding vine mealybug under the wax. So that's um, photo, oops, sorry. This thing. That's your photograph there of your green growing vine. And you peel the wax back. And what do you find but a treasure? Um, and then if you don't inspect or you can't look under the wax of you know all the thousands of vines that you've just purchased you may plant them and then you know in a couple years that's what it looks like when you're cruise around you know removing grow tubes or doing something and all of a sudden you have a christmas tree flocked vine mealybugs so there is still um, or there has been still movement on um, plant material that we're worried about. The other thing, and why you're here, and why maybe some of you have sat through probably 15 years of vine mealybug presentations at this point, is because it's knowledge and resource intensive to manage. So every time I think, oh, we've answered all the questions around vine mealybug management, we get the questions of, should we be using mating disruption year round? You know, when should we be using the different parasites? Um, why are there now two different species of androgyrus and is one better than the other? Um, as new products come in the market, how effective are they? So. Um, and then ant bait, uh, which is another aspect that I'll talk about. And so this is a very intensive pest to manage. And if you're using only one tool, you're probably not being successful. So you need to in have an integrated program where you're looking at having main disruption and insecticides, ant bait if you expect biocontrol to work. So Kent talked uh, about the traps in detail. So they are baited, that you can see that gray thing on there, that's your pheromone lure. You stick it in the trap. Please buy a trap with a white interior 
The males are kind of reddish in color. You buy a red interior trap. You can't see your males very well. I don't think they maybe even sell them so much anymore, but that was a, an issue that we had. And then what you get are your males caught in your traps. So um, they can be, learning how to identify the males takes a little bit of time, but once you're trained to do it, they're pretty distinctive in the traps. They have a unique size, a unique shape. And as I said, they're kind of reddish in color, so they're fairly easy to identify. And thank you for paying your assessments because the Napa Pest, Wine Grape Pest and Disease Cold Control District since 2012 has been doing regional trapping in Napa County. So if you're not already looking at the Ag Commissioner's website and seeing the trap data every year, you should be because that will tell you what your risk is. So as your square where your vineyard and where you're farming turns from green to, you know, yellow to red, well, hopefully before it turns to red, you've become increasingly concerned and even possibly put out some preventative mating disruption. But this is a great way countywide to look at what the risk is, and it's also a great use of the, the assessment funds. So thanks very much to the board for, for selecting to do that. As um, Kent mentioned, we are only trapping from August through October with these traps. So we wanted to be resource efficient. That's the time of year when we're most likely to catch males. So that's the only time the traps are out. And also the trapping density is 25 per square mile which is great for looking overall at the county, but if you're looking at your individual vineyard, you might need some additional information. So like Kent, I like to see site-specific trapping. Um, it gives us greater resolution. It can tell you, okay, well, maybe there's some in my neighborhood, but in this particular block, I'm not catching males yet. Or maybe it tells you that you are catching males, and then you really need to intensify your scouting to see if you can find those nymphs and those females. It also tells you some information about your mating disruption, and it could tell you even when you might want to start mating disruption. So I'm a big proponent of the earlier mating disruption just because in drought years, I think we need to start doing something earlier. It's really hard to do anything under the bark. And before we have a great canopy, you know, you're not going to spray Movento in February, right? So what you can do early season, it's fairly limited. Mating disruption falls into that. It's, it's a good thing. Um, if if you don't control them early enough in the year, you're gonna get a lot of damage later in the season. So that's why I do like the early season being disruption. Oh, and the last thing before I leave that slide is training and awareness. So I can't emphasize enough how important that everyone who steps in the vineyard should be trained on what fine mealy bug looks like and what some of the typical symptoms are. So the honeydew, sooty mold, looking for ants, because even if you have a trap, it just sort of tells you that there's a risk in the area, but you actually have to find those populations. Well, hopefully you don't, but you want to find those populations, and that's usually done by people. So somebody will notice totally wet bark. They'll notice a lot of ants. And from there, that's when we start understanding where our populations are. So um, Matt Doherty, and Tyler Chartel, and I took the data from the regional mapping that the pest district is conducting and we generated a risk map for Napa County. So actually this is getting to be a little old now. It probably needs a refresh because um, it's based on trap data from 2014 to 2018. So the gray areas are where we knew that bind mealy bug was um, established or where we were catching males. And then the colors indicate the risk of spread from those areas. So in a red area, there's a fairly high risk that within a couple years, that block would have, mating, would have fine mealybug, and then orange and yellow. And, and again, this is about four years old now, so it's looking a little bit different. 
And one thing we did learn out of that study is that the traps are a good way of indicating risk. So there's a high risk that you have vine mealybug if you have a trap within about 800 feet that's detecting males. So that's why also I like to see some site-specific trapping, not just relying on the pest districts trapping. So Kent did a great job of covering mating disruption. Just wanted to say from a practical standpoint, when people are first starting to use mating disruption, I've seen a sort of misconception that it, it, it's like a barrier, so it will be just put around the edge of the vineyard. Does not work that way. You need a large area, as Kent showed, the larger the area, the more area that where the males are disrupted, and particularly when you're looking at slopes or highly windy areas. So um, regional programs are great, and um, the traps can tell you sort of when to start your mating disruption, and as we heard during the question and answer session, there is no negative effect on parasitism, and you're not attracting females by putting out your trap either. Um, there's a cryptolamus predator. Um, as we talked about, there is cryptolamus, which can be released, but we also see skimnus and hyperaspis, which are two species that are established here. And both the adult and the larva are predaceous. As Kent said, and I like to emphasize, great for really large populations. They will come in and just decimate. So what you're seeing in that middle photo are two mealybug destroyer larvae, but they've eaten everything else in, in the frame of that photograph. So they will go in and eat the, out of the ovisacs, and they'll eat the smaller nymphs, as you can see in the upper photo, both the larvae and the adults, and it's really important, you know, when you're training people around what mealybugs look like, to also train them on what these mealybug destroyer larvae look like, because I have seen people saying, oh my gosh, I have a lot of mealybugs, and actually it's not mealybugs, but it's destroyer larvae, because they came, they came in and ate all of your mealybugs. Um, it, it do remember that the cryptolamus anyway is a, it's an introduced species, and it's a tropical species. So when we're talking about late season, we're talking about needing a, an a, a average temperature of around 70 degrees to feed and lay eggs, and a peak larval activity being around 80 degrees. That doesn't mean you won't see it more activity at slightly lower temperatures, but this is sort of considered more of a warm weather insect, and it also has, um, will, the adults will disperse in the winter as well. So, oh, there's my video, hopefully, oh, there she's moving. So that is a female anagyrus, and they're distinctive because you can actually see the Oh, it's so dark. You can see the white antennae, hopefully, um, but it can be very easy to pick out. And so this, this was taken. I was just in the vineyard looking for mealybugs, and I saw an anagyrus, and I started filming a video of it. So we do see, well, I do. I'm sure you would, too. Um, but we do see the anagyrus females out there. I do see a lot of parasitism, evidence of parasitism. And we have two generations for every um, vine mealybug generation. You also notice, too, that they're a little bit more active at, at the cooler temperatures. All right. Ants. So who hasn't heard me talk about ants before? <laughs> Is there anyone? Um, we have uh, the most important pest ant is Argentine ant, but don't be fooled. We do have a lot of other ants in the vineyard and some of those which are pests. So ant identification is really important, which is a plug for our upcoming workshop. Cindy Cron and I will be hosting a workshop on ant ID. So if you wanna get down and dirty and looking at ants under microscopes, make sure you, you come to one of the workshops. And the reason why it's a pest is because it is feeding on honeydew and then protecting the mealybugs from parasitism. So when we manage ants, well, when we don't manage ants, we get 
higher rates of, we get higher incidence of mealybugs because we have less parasitism. So over the years, and this also has taken about 20 years that we've been working on ant baits and vineyards, we've looked at many different designs from the sort of laboratory-based baby bottle where we're carrying, you know, 50 pounds of water around in the field and putting them out every three weeks to larger bait stations, which were great until you opened them and they were all funky and moldy and you had to clean them out every year or they got... Um, knocked over by your undervine cultivation to the dry formulations, which unfortunately are not very attractive to Argentine ants. Argentine ants are adapted to a liquid diet, and so they just don't really recruit to these dry baits, which is unfortunate because they're really easy to spread. Um, and to the polyacrylamide baits, which is what we've been using for the last several years. So these are crystals that when they're dry, look like that in your hand. You mix up the bait solution, you dump them in there, they absorb the water, and then they become attractive to the ants. And the nice thing about it is that those can be put into a spreader, either an ATV or a tractor-pulled spreader, and spread throughout the vineyard. So um, if you haven't watched our How to Make Polyacrylamide Ant video and you're having trouble sleeping tonight, well, you know, just go in there and, you know, then you might have dreams like I used to about ants or ants crawling over you. But we have instructions on how to mix and make the bait. Stare at our YouTube channel. And then the application details, we're using about 10 gallons per acre. We've done two applications per season. We generally start in March in the southern part of the county, and then we'll start in April or May up in the northern part of the county. And then we do a second application between four and six weeks later. So this video was sent to me. So somebody was making the bait. They, what we do is we, leave, we, we mix up the bait, we throw in the crystals, and then we leave it overnight for the crystals to absorb the water. Before they had even spread the bait in the vineyard, they had left it overnight in the vineyard, and it was already crawling with ants. So you can just see how attractive this bait is, and then that's why we've been able to really reduce Argentine ant populations. So out of UC Irvine and UC Riverside, they've been working on a bio, because the one thing about the polyacrylamide is that those are actually little plastic crystals. So they're tiny, and you don't really ever notice them, but it is more plastic and microplastics that we're putting into the environment, which we're not too keen about. Um, so the Riverside and UC Irvine team have been working on a biodegradable alginate bait. Um, I've been working with them on that project. They're using it mainly right now in citrus, and they wanted me to drive down there with a you know, vehicle and pick up massive quantities of bait, and I sort of said that's kind of far for me to do that. And I'm impatient. So we um, bought some auger off the internet, because who hasn't you know, used auger in their science career? We said, well, we'll just make our own. So thank you to the person who may want to remain anonymous, but um, they were mixing. So the only thing about the auger bait is that you have to heat the auger. So um, this is last week in the vineyard and mixing the bait, pouring it into a macro bin, and then it solidifies. And then after it solidifies, you know, we break it up into smaller pieces, and then that's Malcolm's backyard right there where we were testing it. You can see that it is attractive to the ants. So we are using, uh, we're going to be trialing that several places this year. I'm looking at this biodegradable bait. So if you ever wanted to re-embrace your science and make agar again, you may have a chance to do that. Um, I went through all of this pretty quickly today. We do have a project website, which thanks to Hannah and everybody else on my team who you know, maintains that for us. We have videos and we have real-time data on all of the different projects that we're working on. So um, give us a visit. And then here's the part where I try to scare you. So find mealybug still spreading. This is back in 2017. Um, and so what are we doing about it? In 
when we first had Vimalia bug in Napa in 2002, we had regional groups. So Carneros group was very active, meeting monthly, talking about management, coordinating management across properties. Um, there have been various groups over the years in Soda Canyon and Oak Knoll, coordinating mating disruption and management. Out in Wooden Valley, there was a lot of concern. They had um, some neighbors who maybe weren't participating as much as they wanted them to, so there was a group out there. And then the Oakville and Rutherford groups have been also long-standing, looking at leaf roll and, and mealybug. And so I don't know if there are any currently active vine mealybug regional groups, but I would argue that given the spread that I've seen in the last two years in Mount Vitor, um, west of Highway 29 in St. Helena and Yonville, uh, in that sort of Rutherford to St. Helena stretch, up in Angwin, oh, and in Oregon, yes. Um, no, not exciting, but yes, they did find uh, vine mealybug males and traps in southern Oregon around Medford. So I would argue that talking to your neighbors, if you farm in any of these areas, well, if you farm anywhere, talking to your neighbors, understanding what the risk of vine mealybug is, is really beneficial. And also, if we could coordinate some Argentine ant management, perhaps on a regional basis, we could suppress Argentine ants, which would really help with our biocontrol efforts. Okay. Ah, now, so I'm going to totally shift gears on you. Um, as you may know, I've also been working on fungicide resistance management and also looking at adoption and what sorts of things drive adoption. And so uh, we did look at adoption for leaf roll and red blotch. So you may have participated either in a survey or you were interviewed by Selena and Malcolm on my team. We want to start doing that for fungicide resistance as well. So I'm asking you either during the break or sometime when it's rainy and you're sad and you don't have that much to do, you're like, oh, maybe I'll just fill out this survey for Monica and Malcolm will really help them with their research. So there's, um, if you want a paper survey, we uh, printed some and put them on the bar. If not, you can take home our QR code and fill out our survey. It would really help us as an industry. So thank you for that. And also, as I mentioned, on May 3rd, we'll have our ant identification workshop. So if you really wanna know what all those different ant species are, can come to that. And then on June 16th, Mark Fuchs will be here and we'll be talking about the recent work that we've been doing on a red blotch disease ecology. That's the um, workshop that was supposed to happen in late January and got postponed because I didn't want to do it over Zoom. I wanted to do it in person. So Mark and I will be, and uh, Jennifer and the team will be talking about um, our red blotch work. And thank you. I didn't check the time. Oh, I'm almost right on time. So I could take questions if there are any. And if not, we will go to break and come back. Can you go back to the slide? Yep. Okay. One question here. Hey, Monica. Um, Something t I was thinking about lately, the winds have been picking up, you know, in the end of harvest, sort of in relation to when there's the flights of the mealybugs and the most in the canopy. And is there any sort of way to monitor potential wind spread of them throughout the county? To mon Sorry, to mo it's really hard to hear up here. To, to monitor mealybugs through wind spread at the end of the season. Oh, monitor for wind dispersed mealybugs at the end of the season. Oh yeah, so we tried to do that. So we had traps up, you know, at various heights looking and seeing if we could find, oh my gosh, I will never ever do that again. So you've got these sticky traps that are catching everything, dirt, dust, and we found it impossible to pick out a mealybug nymph because they're so small on those traps. 
So unless we had a better way to monitor, so we don't have any pheromone that's gonna attract the nymphs, right? Um, so it, it would be great if we could do that, but yeah, the only thing we can monitor really well with any sort of trap are, are the males, not the, not the nymphs, which would be great. I mean, if we could find a way to, to look for nymphs more efficiently, that would be awesome. People were trying um, sniffer dogs for a while, and Kent and I spent years of our life <laughs> um, testing those. And for, uh, you know, they can find bed bugs, they, you know, you see them in the airports and everything, but none of the ones that we ever tested in the vineyard, so the handlers would, would find the mealy bugs, and then suddenly the dogs would find them, but the dogs never found them. I had a question here from Patrick. Oh, Patrick. Hi, Monica. <laughs> um, you mentioned a couple of years ago um, that the vine mealy bug doesn't reproduce as well on non vinifera. So, you know, oh, and, right. and, you know, the potential that maybe high graft vines might provide a little bit of help. Because, yeah. of course, all the trunk is non-vinifera as opposed to the standard graft where it's down at the crown. Is that gone anywhere, you know? No, it's a good point. Thanks for bringing that up. We did have a trial where we had planted some high grafted vines. And then the vineyard change management and the trial got lost. And then we had lost a bunch of them to replants. But it, it was something that we were looking at and then seeing if we could, you know, to Kent's point too, if, if we could drive them more up into the canopy, um, which is a good and a bad thing, right? Up in the canopy on the leaves, it's easier for us to, to manage them and you get greater parasitism, um, but it also drives them potentially up into the fruit, right? So you have this kind of mixed, um, but yeah. As far as I know, um, Rachel Naglia, when she was at USTA Parlier, was looking at different root stocks. Um, I, it, I'm not aware that it's really coalesced into anything but maybe we should revisit that. Okay. Anything online? All right, that's me out. We have a 10 minute break and as you may know, restrooms are downstairs and towards the river. So thank you everyone and we'll see you in 10. About 10 years ago, Brian was on the VitTech Executive Committee and he said, I think we should invite Walt Mahaffey here because he's doing these impaction spore traps and I think it could be really important for us to have that information to start thinking about our powdery mildew programs and our powdery mildew inoculum. So we're now 10 years later, 12 years later, okay, I don't do math very well. Um, and we have Brian here today to talk to us about a regional spore trap network and how we can use those to start thinking about our powdery mildew spray program. So Brian Ron, soil scientist, crop consultant, man of many talents, and he's gonna talk to us today about that. Thank you, Brian. Well, good morning, everyone. Yes, man of many talents. So, yes, Brian Ron. I'm a soil scientist, and a, a, a certified crop advisor. I'm a QAL, and I'm also a grape grower. So, um, when I first was looking at spore trap, ta spore trap technology and the idea of it, I developed it because I wanted the tool. So, we're going to talk about kind of spore traps in general, how they work and what they do and what they don't do. We're going to look at the spore trap network. We're going to look at some maps, look at some historical data of how the inoculum has kind of spread through our, our, network, uh, our network over the last three years or so. And then we're going to talk about the data and how you use it and how we use it as growers to help us with our powdery mildew control programs. And I probably wasn't going to say this, but I was standing and talking to somebody in the back. And so I'll say it now. The, 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 my talk could be, we spray too much. So you got to spray. If you've got a problem to, to deal with, 
deal with it. We just got to do a better job of it, of making sure our timing's right and making sure our coverage is right. Okay, we'll start with basics here. Disease triangle, we know we planted the host plant. The environment, we've got the uh, powdery mildew risk index. That's the, you know, the, the environment part. We've got the environment to grow it. And then, of course, we've got powdery mildew around. I'll get that right. Powdery mildew around. So early on in my, earlier in my career, before I got into the spore trap things, if you had asked me once the grapes started pushing, are powdery, grape powdery mildew spores around from bud break on? And if I push past an interval, would, be a, would I have a high risk of getting grape powdery mildew? I would have said yes and I would have been wrong, and I was wrong, because the great powdery mildew spores are not always present. So that was the revelation of spore traps for me. Okay, so this, the great powdery uh, risk index, that's the Goobler thomas model, that's environmental conditions. It's a great model. It really is a fantastic model. They looked, but what they're looking at, and was, was is just temperature, just environment, and what, what that was really intended to do, and it is conservative, it's a conservative model, it was intended to look at, after ASCO spore release, when you've got the pathogen present, how fast will it develop in your vineyard? That's what it was intended to do. If it's developing quickly, you spray tighter. If it's not developing quite as quickly, you can stretch your sprays. Okay, I got this down. This is the, off the UC website. You can see the index, the disease pressures, that's low, 40 to 50 moderate. You're gonna maybe stretch this, and then high, you're gonna make it tight. But here's the issue. Pathogen status, present, present, and present. Okay, that's what's changed. So now the disease triangle looks a little bit like this. We identify when the pathogen arrives and, and, and what the population is. All right, so we'll do a little terminology here. Again, the risk index is how conducive is the environment to growing the powdery mildew that you already have, or to having a spore germinate and start to grow and develop a population. Presence is going out in your vineyard, finding it. Presence is also detecting spores. Great powder mildew spores entering your vineyard. Okay, so this is typically what we would do. We would go out and we'd maybe see someone we're scouting and we'd find it, but we'd still have time to treat it and before it got economic. What Spore Traps allows us to do is just gives us more time. We catch the spores before they germinate and catch them as they enter. Okay, Monica touched on this, but this was uh, Walt Mahaffey. Uh, had a spore trap and, uh, at a research station, and uh, Seth Schweb, I don't, I don't think Seth is here, and I were speaking with him. And yeah, he was saying, yeah, I can catch these spores. I can catch great powdery mildew spores when they're blowing in the air and come into a vineyard. As a grower, I went, I want that. So we started working with spore traps, and the, uh, the first place I put any new technology I look at is my own vineyards. So we were able to get a greater understanding of lab techniques. We were able to improve our traps. We were, and where are you gonna place the traps? How often do you have to test them? What analytical methods do you use? All of that. Um, this collaboration allowed us to make a better mousetrap. So, um, let's see here. Oh, this is, this was, this is our current trap, or not really our current one, it's one we have the most of. We have a new, a new uh, a model that's more compact. Uh, a, there's another generation of sport traps, but basically they all have electronics. We put these little deflecto shields on there to, when they're moving the wires or they uh, won't knock the rods off the spinning head there. It's a rotating rod trap. There's a, sport, a uh, solar panel over here and electronics, and I'll give you a little close up of the business end of this thing. That speaker's kind of in the way. But you can, these rods, are what, it has some lubricant on them and they spin at 3,000 RPM and, a lot, and it's an air sampler. And these rotating arm samplers uh, sample the highest volume 
of air of any type of trap, the suction traps, you name it, these things, these things collect the highest volume of, uh, of, of air. So these rods are, we c collect these rods of their one use nitrile gloves or alcohol or whole procedure to present, prevent cross contamination because that was part of our early learning curve. So we collect those, those rods and we get, we get them analyzed. So they're analyzed by, uh, by a lab, they're a PhD pathologist, and we use the qPCR test because the qPCR test is, has shown to be the most sensitive. And this is the other part of it. It's the Q part is it's gives us a number of spores. At first, we kind of had a plus or minus test, but it's different if you have, say, less than 10 spores and 10,000 spores. So now we can detect down to a few spores. So when, when we get the numbers back, we can, we can tell you whether you've got less than 10 or just a, a very high population. So what you do is you analyze the, the, the it's the analyze for the DNA of powdery mildew of grape. Not on the weeds, not on any other powdery mildew, but of grape. So we can tell you, or the lab can tell you, when we get these back, and it takes about, by the time we sample them within 24 to 48 hours, we've got the numbers back and uploaded. So they can, it's a, it's a rapid turnaround time for them, which is helpful as growers. Okay. Spot samples, the glove, there's glove samples that Walt's talking about a lot about where you go through and you can get glove samples. We, we don't do a lot of that, but some of our growers, if we get some detections, want us to go out and, and do some spot samples and you can do that. You kind of run gloves down the, down the, the uh, canopy and then you get a swab and then you could get it analyzed. If, if there's areas that you're concerned about, you can kind of extrapolate the traps by doing some, some spot samples here or there. So that's out there and it, it works. Okay, this is CBC Ag. This is the Spore Trap Network. This app allows anybody with a trap in our network to look at their data. Okay, so here you go. Why Spore Trap Network? When I first started using spore traps, it was difficult for me to trust it. So I was a small scale, we had them out, but I was scouting, scouting it, vigorously scouting this thing, saying it's not detected. Is it working? Is it working? It was working. And I got more comfortable with the idea that, hmm, in these particular vineyards, this is when the inoculum arise because it went, again, it went against what I knew or what I understood that the powdery mildew spores after bud break, they're everywhere. Well, they're not. So the first step was, okay, I've got spore traps. I'm looking, I'm looking in the hot spot. I'm looking in prevailing winds and I'm trying to catch if, and this is what I tell people when I work with spore traps is I tell them, okay, if I was saying, I'm going to give you just one spot in your vineyard to scout for powdery mildew all year, you can just look in one, where would you look? Well, that's where you put a spore trap right there, right? The, the spot that you would first go to, to find powdery mildew. Well, that worked great, but what we were ignoring was we never see powdery mildew over here and over there. So then we said, okay, well, maybe, maybe we're spraying too much here. We're, we're, we're hitting the hot spots. That's the canary in the coal mine type of a spore trap because you, you don't want to miss anything because the punishment for, for powdery mildew on your fruit is brutal. And it, I've seen it, understand it. So you, ha you have to have that. Well, we started looking at prevailing winds because there were a number of locations where we just weren't getting much inoculum. And some of the old timers would tell me, maybe I'm an old timer now, um, uh, the, uh, oh, we dust three times, four times a year. You idiots are just spraying way too much. Well, the people that were spraying too much had a high spore load. The people out there, that we, a few dusts a year gets me by, didn't have spore presence that the light went on. It's like, oh, that's how they're getting, that's how they got away with it, is that you have different areas that have different amounts of inoculum in their vineyards. And we'll look at some maps and, uh, and some of the data that we get back, uh, uh, when we look at the maps is not what we'd expect. Okay, and this is it. Fear, fear, oh my God, we're gonna get mildew. It's just spray it, just spray it. Just put it on, spray the darn thing. 
Okay? All right. Maybe not. All right. So, stressful to change our programs. But reliable data helps us sleep at night. If you're able to look at this thing, and I tell people working with Sportrast, baby steps. You don't, oh, you're going to say, you're going you're gonna to stretch some sprays and you're going to start to understand when the, when the spores arrive in your vineyard and you're going to get a pattern down of what's typical for the vineyards that you're working in. And then it'll help you sleep at night when you're saying, okay, I'm going to stretch that. All right? Because the network, the network is the next step. Now you're able to kind of peek across a lot of fences and say, am I able, now I can look across Napa Valley and say, have they detected anything in the valley? I was privy to this because I was running the dang network. So I, and that was a big help to me. So then, hence the desire to, well, to make it e easier for me to communicate, we'll make a Spore Trap Network app. And that was, um, I was probably biting off a lot more than I thought I was trying to get an app made and get it together and get it working. It's working and it seems to be working okay. Uh, so, but, and that's what we have now. So th what that does is it gives us more of the, oops, I'm gonna go back, how do I go back? We'll give it back one, yes. Um, more canaries in the coal mine. And this is, this is the other part of it, is that we kinda, we kinda it's a visual of where you can kinda learn where the inoculum starts. And when we start to spread out this data about with, with in the network of growers, well, it's, it's gonna, uh, it's more than me just looking at it. It's a lot of people looking at it. And I think there's, there's some a learning process that we can go through there. Okay, well, let's have some fun. This was, a, this was a look at the map. I'll explain this briefly. This is Napa County here. And you can see we've carved it up into these little regions this is Pope Valley, this is we call North Center. We've looked at the data and we've kind of found areas that tend to perform differently. And so Sonoma County's carved up. There's some here in the south down there, Carneros, and there's the coastal areas there. This is Carneros down here. This was early on, uh, April 17th of 2020, so that we don't have that many traps there. And what these little polygons are, the little pie charts tell you, if it's green, there were no detections. If you have a little slice there, there's a percentage, that's the percentage of positive traps. And the yellow number is less than 10 spores. If it's, if it's more than 10 spores, then it's red. So if you don't see red, there's never been a detection more than 10 spores in any of our spore traps. And back, back when resistance was running rampant because we didn't understand it, we had thousands, counts in the thousands in vineyards. This is, this is 2020, and so we're probably doing a better job with that. So the populations do spike in some areas, and, and this only shows a portion of our network, and there's some other areas that there will be, there are some definite red spikes in it, but I don't have any slides of it today. So we'll just take a, 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 a stroll down memory lane. This, this is the 24th. Uh, it, uh, this is 2020, April 24th. This is, shows a little more of the network. There's more, more pie charts there because the, we've collected more samples. Not one detection in the entire network. So if you're looking at that saying, hmm, I don't know, I'm getting, uh, I can go 14 to 21 days, and there's not one detection in that network. Eh, maybe, maybe 21? Can I sleep at night or am I going to spray that? That's, and that's, a baby step thing that you start to start to look at. Okay, we'll look again. There's next the next week. We start to get detections in Napa here, and this is typically where it shows up first. It not Carneros, huh? Well, it's supposed to be Carneros. That's where all the spores are, right? Um, so typically, this is this is the mid valley is where we typically get our first few, few first few hits. Lodi, this is that Lodi area, there's nothing there. We got a few hits here. And I'm not real panicked about that because though that's a low inoculum level and there's, and there's not very many detections, low, low percentage. So depending on what's going on with your individual ranch, you would make the appropriate decision. All right, May 8th, what happened there? Hold on, oh, I'll go back. See, these were positive, right? And then all of a sudden we go here and they're gone. 
What the, what the app does is it takes the most, current net, the most current data and plugs it in. So as we get more data into it, if the, if the subsequent tests for, uh, for all of this area here are all negative, it will update the map on the, uh, as soon as we get that data into the system when it's uploaded. So we're back to no detections, although Eastern Lodi seems to be getting exciting. So again, here we go. We got a, a, a low detection level here, May 15th. May 22nd, still not a lot of action. We're probably spraying a lot, I think. Oh, always spray, or always spray early, always. Because we all have a mess to clean up from the previous year. Okay, we let the milk, great powder mildew grow. So always spray early, always spray at bloom, always. You've got a lot of other things to put on, always spray at those times. So even though all oh, these are clean and this is that, that you, I, personally, I would have one, I use oil early, that's my choice. I use oil, hit the trunks, hit, hit them good, 2% oil, you do what you'd like. And I always spray at bloom. And then I follow the traps. Okay. So, Lodi's heating up a little bit. Still not a lot of action there. Not really. May 29th. And the reason that I'm just kind of clicking this by weeks is that we, uh, the feeling was we spray, uh, we spray a lot early on. You know, we spray when it's cold and it's wet and it's all this stuff. We spray early on to cover them all so we're clean by bloom. The reason we're clean by bloom in some instances is there's just not a lot of inoculum around. Just isn't. So that's why, we're, that's why our programs are so successful early. Not, it's not present anywhere. Lodi there is heating up. Carneros is heating up. So yeah, but that's May 29th. Again, yikes, you know? If I was looking at that network, that area of the network, but we, we, and we've got a little presence here, and I'll flip ahead. June 6, Lodi's closing up a little bit more. That's looking like they've got a lot of inoculum, not high levels, but it's everywhere. June 19th, we still have a, we're getting a few lo hits, low, low populations, Carneros, not so much, which is one of the surprises. I thought Carneros was loaded. And then here we go. June 26th, boom, all the traps start to light up. Okay, game on, July 3rd. Okay, another, another one of the, the old timer wisdom. Uh, you, you typically see uh, powdery mildew around the 4th of July. Wonder why? The inoculum starts to really pile up or be pre prevalent near the end of June and into early July. So the mildew that you see in, Ju in early July has nothing to do with, this, with what you stretched in April. Just doesn't, and we'll get to that. My opinion. All right. Okay, 21. We'll take a quick, I'll zoom through this. I have no idea how I, Oh, great, I've got, I've got lots of time, okay. <laughs> uh, um, all right, so here we go. Oh, we'll go back. Come on, obey. All right, April 17th, we just got more out there. Lodi's clean, we've got a little bit of hits here in Sonoma, and the Sonoma, the, the, probably the most concentrated network we have is Napa Valley. Sonoma's next and it's coming up, and actually Lake County's coming up as well. There's, been, there's more and more adoption of, of the traps of, for growers, because uh, and we'll talk about that later. Um, all right, so early on, April 17th, we have some hits here, and yes, I, you know, you're gonna, you would have put on your first spray, your spray to clean up your mess, right? So we're, we're protected. Nothing in Napa, nothing in Lodi. Napa's still clean. We got a little bit in Sonoma here. Lodi's still clean. 
And this is probably 130 traps, maybe 130, 140 traps spread out through this whole area. So it's a, it's quite, it's, it's a number of them. Okay, May 7th, not one hit in the network yet. Not one. May 21st, there it is, kind of that north center. We finally get a hit. It's one, it's one trap but the rest of the network is clean, okay? Okay, getting into June, you can see, I'll go back one, Lodi goes from nothing detected to both sides. We start to get detections, inoculums there. And okay, question I get is, what's a good number for a spore trap? You know, what's a high number, what's a, what's a good number? Detection is detection, in my opinion, as a grower. If I know the pathogen's present, I'm concerned. That's treatable. Now, if I get some stair-stepping stuff, and we'll talk about that, there's different things you could, uh, but if I'm looking at it from, am I gonna stretch, am I gonna stretch? If it's clean, it's clean. If I get any detection in my vineyard, the hot spot, wherever, game on. Time to go. You've got a susceptible crop, and you've got the pathogen presence. How many spores does it take to create a problem? Mm, probably not very many, so game on, okay? But if I'm looking at it and my vineyard isn't very, isn't uh, positive, and I've got a little sliver of something showing up somewhere, not so worried about it. If I'm starting to, if these are starting to grow, let's see how that, if, if this was, was maybe more than half, I start looking around a little bit, saying, okay, well, eh, it's in the neighborhood, there's a number of spores blowing around, uh, okay, so you got my attention. But June 12th, Carneros, that lit up, right? Okay, so that was June 4th, and look at Carneros, holy smokes. Isn't that supposed to be Mildew City? So, we're getting, a, we're getting some hits here. Napa Valley proper, we got a, a, a little bit, and that's into, that's into June. Lodi's heating up again, but it seems to be typical for that, that spot. And here you go, there's a good look at, at, at and the east side is, is hotter than the west side in Lodi. This is I-5, this is more of the delta, it's cooler, you get delta breezes. But, the, and typically where it's hotter and up in this zone and bore in the hills and up in there where these traps are, it is a little bit hotter and the, the conventional wisdom is the heat, uh, mildew isn't as bad. They seem to have some presence there. So another, maybe another myth, I don't know. Carnero's still clean. We got little specks here and there, heating up here. So this would, have, this would get my attention. All right, June 26, look at Carnero still. What in the world? And, you know, the inoculum seems to kind of show up and then disappear and show up. And one, and one thing I've noticed in the, in the network, and this is why I'm thinking the folks that are in the network and look at this data can help, uh, uh, help me interpret. It seems like whenever we get high wind events, we tend to get hits, at, more hits. And, the, and, and how far does a spore trap go? We don't know. But, Powdery mildew, I think, in these high wind events, the inoculum can travel quite a ways. And we get little spots that will show up here and there. That'll start to, that'll start to um, show up. Okay, so Lodi's doing what it's doing. Carnalis is still good, but we're, we're picking up some steam here. Still clean here. This is Petaluma area for, for the, they're, still, they're still running clean. Napa North is clean. And that, and that really isn't too much of a surprise. Calistoga is pretty hot. And it, uh, you know, the, you tend to, the, the pressure goes down or the powdery uh, risk index drops when you get over 95 degrees. That's the good news. Here's the bad news. Uh, when we measure leaf temperatures, and we do that in real time for uh, uh, leaf VPD stuff and irrigation scheduling stuff. Uh, if you irrigate, your leaves can be 12 to 14 degrees cooler than ambient. 
So if you have a well-watered vineyard that's growing well and the ambient temperature is 95, the temperature of the bottom side of that leaf is probably 80 something. So in that instance, you would not drop the risk index. You would keep it up on high alert because the 95 degree temperature isn't stopping powdery mildew that's on the underside of the leaf that's a lot cooler. So that's something we're looking at, we're looking at to in incorporate into the system. Uh, haven't got to that programming yet. Probably won't this year, maybe next year. Okay. Here we go, July 9th. But this is typically when we, or in 2020, we had much higher numbers everywhere. So the 4th of July thing might be a little bit later, and it is. Here you go. It's, we're getting much more, much more uh, widespread detections. And just to show you that, oh, can these things, can these things, I'm just showing you early data up till July and stopping. I'm putting this up slide up here. This is from 2021 where we didn't get our first detection till May 21st. This is what it looks like later on in the, in, in the season. This is what, August 21st? And I, the reason I show this slide is that this map here, this map can look like this. I, I put them that way so I could protect the innocent because uh, it's hard to figure out where, where everything is. But this is another view of the same map. But this is typically what happens. Once things really get rolling, and the inoculum is out there, and we're starting to, and, and uh, the presence is there, then yes, we, the, the network shows widespread presence. It just takes a lot longer than we thought it would. Okay. Yeah, this year, oh boy. Okay, so remember we didn't get a detection until May 21st last year. Okay, here we are, April 5th, detection. Down in Carneros. Oh, we've got Carneros and Napa North. Light detections, but they're there. Spread out is the eighth. And now I'm just kind of going day by day, because if you want to click on this app day by day, you can. And if, if, there's, if there's a new update for your zone, it'll show. Okay, we've got a hit on the east side, and we've got the Napa North, Napa North Center dropped out, but these two are present. So it looks like we're getting low presence detecting earlier this year than we did last year. Is that, does we all run out there and spray everything? Well, I mean, it's different. And that's, that's part of what, what spore traps were doing this network and looking at this data is, is what happened last year? How did that work out for me? What does this year look like? This is the ninth, Lodite's clean, something in Carneros. We still have some detections up here in Napa, which was, again, unusual. The 11th, Lodite's clean, holding pretty much the same. And this was, yeah, this was the 13th. I just screenshot shot the app. Um, not much going on here, but we seem like we've got some low detections around. So. Put on, your, put on your early sprays. Um, so that is, I think, it for, oh, yeah. All right. Don't, forgot my own slides. The, um, all right, this is what it looks like, but if you zoom in on the app, you will see this. All the individual traps, if you have traps in it, you will see your individual traps. If they're positive, you'll see a yellow or an orange there. You'll see green if it's good and they kind of flash at you. It's all, it, it's all real cool. Um, but it, it, you see each individual trap and if you click on each individual trap, it'll, it'll pop up, it'll, if, if you had a positive, it'll tell you what the number is. And then you click on this little graph right there and it'll show you the data. So on your phone, you just click through and see what the graph looks like. This one was clean, and, I've, and I'm using different, <laughs> uh, uh, different uh, data because it, it, it's live data for, for, for growers, for particular clients, so I've kind of mixed it up there. But this, when it's green like that, that means nothing was detected. If it's yellow, it's, it's below 10. And then if it's red, then um, that's a, we call that a high level. It's just 10. And this is all, it's all scroll over, and when you scroll over, you can see the numbers, these are static slides. But the, what you'll see is that the, 
the maximum temperature. Let me explain the scale, I guess. On this scale, you've got, uh, let that go there. Um, on this scale, you've got great powdery mildew spores. It's logarithmic because we had to try to display 10 spores and 10,000 spores on the same graph without having it be five miles tall. So if you're less, if it's, so 10 spores, 100 spores as you go up, this scale, one to 100, this is, this is the, the maximum temperature and the uh, risk uh, index scale. This temperature rating of 100 is probably too low. We'll probably increase that to 120. <laughs> All right, it maxes out above that. So it'll show you what the maximum temperature was. It'll show you what the risk index was and what, you know, whether it was clean or what your number was, what, what your spore count was. And, and if, it's, if it's less than 10, it'll just tell you 10. If it's 22, it'll tell you 22 or 25 or 1,015, a, a, a whatever that number is. So that's, that's the progression through it. You go from looking at that map there to kind of seeing all, all your stuff to see if there's any, any yellow areas, and then you click on it and you can kind of see the graph if you want to look at it. Okay, let's talk about reading spore trap graphs. Drink your caffeine. Uh, so I, 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 exp I explained the, the, the sides here. This, this is off of uh, the desktop. So this sh the app only shows you three weeks, three, three or four weeks of data. This, this will show you, this will show, this accesses the database. So if you have years of data, you, you'd, click there and you'd pick, pick your vintage and you'd look at what happened last year and the year before that. So what I did is I took a couple of these and I just ran, ran some, this, this one here is just to explain it, but I took a, a trap, two, one trap in Napa and another trap in Sonoma and I ran, I don't know, four years of data just so you can see how things change. Okay, so this one here, May 25th, we got a hit. And this is, this is what I, this is what I wanted to show you, is the, the mildew risk index went up. And this is, when, this is when we start ringing the alarm bells, but there is no pathogen present. We weren't detecting anything. So I would stretch that, me. Of course, I sprayed here and I'm spraying at bloom. We got, we got one hit here, and anytime I, anytime I see, a, see presence, yep, yep, time to go. It was clean for a few weeks and then steady presence. Just basically, and that's not risk index, steady presence. Pathogens there and it's in, as far as I'm concerned, sufficient numbers to create a problem. Okay, this is uh, Mid Valley. This is the Napa Valley uh, where their first detection here, looks like it's about June 8th. And then the risk index crawls up and you get pretty steady presence all the way along. Okay, that was in, probably too small for you to see, but that's 2018. Okay, this is 2019. What happened here? The weather quit, now the weather station got hammered. So <laughs> we, lost, we, lost our weather, we lost our weather feed there. But, okay, so it was June 8th. Here it came in at June, June 3rd, and then pretty steady present. So that vineyard, I'm looking at that one. If I own that one, I'm saying, okay, it looks like early June when we're fairly getting our first hits. So if I'm looking at this vineyard and all of a sudden I get a hit in April, what, what's different? I typically don't pick up anything until June, but now I've got hits in April? Hmm, okay, that ought to get your attention. And this is part of the baby steps, learning how to use the data, is what's typical for your, what's typical for your vineyard and then looking at the outliers and saying, well, this is different than what I typically see, what's going on? Okay. But it looks like it, looks like it stayed in pattern there. And now, 2020, first hit was July 20th. What? Yeah, July 20th. So I'd probably stretch some of this. And okay, here we go, let's talk budgets. So, all right, well, you have one that looks like this and your intervals are tight, you're slowing down, you're taking care of business and you're spraying. And then you got one that looks like this that maybe you're not spraying as much. Well, when you're talking to the bean counters, well, I sprayed more there because we had more presence. 
we had more present, we had to spray more. And this one, we were able to lower, lower the budget or spread it out or whatever, whatever you want to do. And, and that is uh, another term, or, or we're going to skip a spray. Well, I don't know about skip a spray, uh, depending on, on how, you, how you use the traps, and we'll get to that. But if you're stretching by a week, eventually that does skip one. You don't say, oh, we're going to spray number four, I'm out. We're not going to do that. You just are able to stretch them a bit, and then you eventually will spray less. But this is not unusual. And no, they don't have a mildew problem. All right, this is that same one, 2021. We got a hit earlier, June 21st, and then, and then back, to the, back to the 19th, July 19th for the next hit. But again, 2022, when we started out, we're getting some, not at this, this particular vineyard, I'm not singling them out, but there's some vineyards now we're getting some ticks early. Don't know why. So 2022 is a little different than 2021. All right, this is Sonoma. I know if there'd be Sonoma growers here, maybe they're sneaking over to see what we're doing. I hope so. Uh, I go over there. Um, our first hit here is June, early June. That is on in 18. 19, we got, we got a hit in early June. And then really not an awful lot of presents, but enough to where you're going to keep spraying that. And then here's 2020, which is a lot, which was completely different than the other one. Remember, we are way out here in the 21st, 20th of July, uh, of July. This is June 8th, and it's just steady presence. And you're starting to get the, you're starting to get these things climbing up. Game on here. Here's here is when we're spending our money on sprays, right here. Yeah, you're doing some work here, but right here is where your budget goes. Because this is, this, is when, this is when we get mildew. Okay. Yeah, we, this is all true. Yeah, we're, but this, this is it. We're grape growers. I'm a grape grower. And I'm hoping that as these other grape growers look at this network, that they'll give me some wisdom of what they're seeing and we'll get more out of it. Okay. Using it. We're going to talk a little about using the data. How do you, how do you use this stuff? This is it. Directs field op operations. Okay, so now you've got one and uh, you've got a hit in this vineyard, uh, these vineyards over here, but not over there. Where are you going to leaf first? Where are you going to shoot then first? You know, and this is the thing. Uh, my, pro my spray program grows from south to north or east to west, or are we going a clockwise rotation? Is that how we irrigate? We irrigate, we need to put the water. Spray where you need to spray. Move, the, move your equipment where the problem is. And, and it's like, well, where am I going to leave first? If I, had a pa if I had a positive trap, that's where I'm going. You know, because I know everybody's got plenty of labor and can just get wherever they want, whenever they want, and do everything right on time. As we struggle with the lack of labor, this will help you direct. Okay, when, you look, when you're looking at that canopy, can I, act, can I effectively spray it? If the answer is no, that's where you're going next. Okay, I think we're gonna talk about, oh yes, here it is. Coverage, coverage, coverage. All right, so again, the mildew you see at the 4th of July did not happen in April. An infection takes about two weeks from when the spores arrive to when the mildew is there and starts to spread. So that happened two or three weeks ago. And almost every mildew disaster I see or problem is coverage. We're all doing a pretty good job of flogging away, just bam, 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 and that's this point here. Check your nozzles, the spray, uh, a poor spray job isn't helping very much. But if you're looking at that canopy and I'm saying, okay, if I put those spray cards in there, do you think you're gonna hit the middle? If I look at that back, are you going to hit the back of that bunch? If the answer is no, you're going to have mildew. Because you now have expanding berries, brand new tissue that's never been sprayed. And you've got the pathogen present, and now you're telling me you can't hit it. 
They'll lose. So I'm looking at it, and the difference in coverage between two miles an hour and three miles an hour is amazing. It isn't necessarily 100, I'll put on 100 gallons a minute. I mean, 100 gallons per acre. That helps. If you slow down and put those cards out there, you will be amazed. You'll be terrified also <laughs> by, the, by the coverage. And this is, um, nothing covers like sulfur. Now, I don't care what products you buy, but you should be tank mixing some sulfur into it. I love oils. I like to put oils early. I don't like oils mid-season because when I spray oil, I turn the bunch around and I can't see any on the back. If I'm not hitting the back and the berries are growing and I'm not covering it, hmm. So, I mean, you all make your own choices, but that, um, I think there's uh, uh, some fuming with sulfur. When I walk through the vineyard and smell that wonderful sulfur, it makes me... <laughs> <laughs> it makes me happy. Is it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make my wife happy because I come home smelling of sulfur. But yeah, it's uh, uh, part of the it's it's coverage. It's coverage, and the nozzle the nozzle that's, that isn't quite right that we haven't replaced yet. The pressure, the varying pressure in our pump that isn't working quite right. That area where the tractor goes like this and misses that one spot and it gets started. Yeah, that's, it, it's, a uh, I think a bunch of lousy sprays kind of get the job done. If we can do a better job of coverage, we could probably do less spraying and do maybe a better job. Okay, and this, yeah, that cover, covered that one. I said this, I guess, always early season to clean up our mess, always spray at bloom. And whenever you have inoculum present, yeah, got inoculum present. Go get them. All right. All right, I'm just going to look at some of this, some of this data here and just set, tell you how I would deal with this. How I do it. Everybody does, has their own thing. But okay, so I'm looking at a low population and a high risk index. This tells me I have the pathogen present and a great environment to grow it. Yeah. Okay, well, it's there, and it's a good, it's a good situation to grow it. All right, got my full attention. Here we've got, you know, low, low population, and it's hot, and isn't a good, good situation to grow mildew. Would I stretch that a little bit? Yeah, probably, me. And as you learn your vineyards, you'll know where you can stretch and where you can't. So, show you it's not all lollipops and rainbows. <laughs> there are these where you've got pretty good presence, high numbers, you've got the environment to grow it. Yeah, boy, slow down, leaf that thing, cover it, cover it, cover it. And then, oh, the risk index went down, but this stair stepping's going up. Oh my, yeah, keep, tighten your intervals, slow down, figure out what in the, what in the world's going wrong with, with, with your coverage and take care of it. This I wouldn't change, this stair stepping here, this is where the Q part of the QPCR thing comes in, is the quantity, when these things start to stair step like this, you have an infection or your neighbor has an infection. And I would scout that like you wouldn't believe. One, uh, in my vineyard, I, we had two, we typically have two, one in the hot spot, one up on the hill. And the one on the hill was lighting up. I told my techs, go find the mildew. I know it's there, detecting it. It came up again uh, the following week. We had another, and I said, okay, great. I'm gonna go look. And it was in the grow tubes. Yeah, the things we never sprayed. So what we did, we picked up the grow tubes and hammered them, but it was an inoculum source that I really wasn't aware of. We got that beautiful little greenhouse of all those green leaves in there that we never spray. So if you're getting some, what appears to be mildew problems with a bunch of replants in there. You might have look at the tubes. We found some in there and that was enlightening. Okay, we talked about this, the spore resist, the sample rods can be tested for fungicide resistance. We all know about the QOI resistance and the other frac materials. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's not good news from the researchers that are doing that. More materials are 
showing resistance. Um, uh, more and more classifications are showing resistance to, to uh, uh, fungicides. Uh, I mean, the, the powdery mildew is resistant to the fungicide. So it's getting worse. It's getting worse. And all these classes that are brand new are coming under question. So we're going to have to l learn to live with this. And this is this. OK, we're going to rotate modes of action. We're going to use sulfur and oil where we can because it isn't prone to, uh, to resistance. And this is it is that the grower group should, could, should revisit the use of small amounts of sulfur after bloom. If your winery's telling you, and I'm, hopefully, maybe there's some winery people here, hopefully. Um, we, need to, we need to work with our winery partners here and be able to put two, three pounds of wettable sulfur into your, into your mixes later in the season. And what that's going to do, it's just going to pro prolong the life of these fungicides because they're not going to make it on their own if we're not putting some sort of resistant material in. So this is a, this is a bigger conversation than what we're having here today, but uh, that's what I'm preaching to my winery clients, and some of them are receptive to it, some of them are not. But the idea that, okay, it's bloom time and we're gonna stop using sulfur because of hydrogen sulfide in wine, that's never been true. Never been true. But, and maybe that's changing, but with the resistance problem growing like it is, and uh, uh, we need to reach out, our groups need to reach out to their groups and talk to them about, uh, the research says this isn't a problem, we're not talking about putting on 10 pounds of dusting sulfur. Uh, we can do this. And it'll, what it'll do is it'll help, it'll help us save the chemistries that we've got. So. There's my uh, resistance soapbox. All right, I am a soil scientist, and I did not coin this term, but I'm a soil hugger. <laughs> I think we all are. We know that's where our life is, right? That's where our, that's where our roots are. That's where everything happens for us. So. This whole thing, well, we're going to get this spore trap, and I've got my bean counter hat on, and I need a ROI, return of investment on this thing. That's a no-brainer if, if you can stretch your sprays because you're not spraying, er uh, spraying early. That's a no-brainer. The, the other half of the equation for, for the, is, is soil health. Running equipment on wet soil, it's raining out. It washed off all our protection, let's go spray. Quick. I mean, it washed off, right? But what if there's no presence? Can we wait a few days and let it dry up a little bit and not compact our soils and create other problems with the soil health and, and these types of things? That's some of the, the hidden costs. Uh, it's, uh, you know, and then you, you know, the carbon footprint, the fuel. I mean, fuel's cheap, right? And the sprayers are easy to find, right? And equipment's cheaper, right? No? So the cost of each spray is going up and the carbon footprint that, that you know, the part of this whole thing increases as we run this equipment. If we can stretch and get, get it rid of a spray or two, or maybe not, depending on if you're one of the lucky few that has presence all the time, stay on your program. Spray and don't miss it. Great, control it, because the first thing we've got to do is grow canes, the next thing we've got to do is, is get, get fruit to set, and the third thing we have to do is pick it. So yeah, we have to have clean fruit to do that, so by all means do that. But this is something, oops, it just uh, degrades soil structure. And pore spaces are important. Oops, we're gonna go back one. The lack of pore spaces changes the environment in the soil. The good guys or gals or whatever they are, the good ones uh, are, uh, thrive in an aerated soil. The water molds and all the, all the more pathogenic type of microbes do well in, in anaerobic conditions, waterlogged conditions. So as you start compacting the soils, the bad, the bad, bad pathogens or bad fungi will eat the more beneficial ones. So maintaining that that 
mixture of pore spaces is, is really important because it changes the biota in the soil. And that's where, that's, that's where we make our money. I was working uh, on a project and we were, so they were gonna move some soils around. And I was talking to the, the, the construction people and showing them the topsoil. And I said, you see that brown soil right there? And they said, yeah, what about it? I said, that's money. That costs money to make and money to maintain. So as you're moving this soil around, put that stove over here and, and go through, move your stuff, then put it back on the top. That's just the basic stuff. So yes, that, it, that, that's what we're trying to conserve is our topsoils and conserve the health of them. Okay, okay, I'm done. Yeah, all right. Yes. I just want to leave a little time for questions. Okay, good. I, I thought I would be way under. Okay, so basically, this is, this is the madness we're up to now. You type in bot canker spore traps. We're running a network now. Yikes. So uh, uh, that's all I'll say is yikes. We're studying that data, trying to figure out what to do with that. Why? Because I want to know when to prune. And I, and, and I want to know if I need to paint or what I'm doing, what I'm doing with those pathogens. And right now it looks like, uh, yeah, it's around. And so you can do botrytis and grape powdery mildew and boom, there you go. Ah, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Sure. <laughs> okay, we have some questions online as well. Uh-oh. So one online is the concept depends on the accuracy of the traps. What if they are located in an area that is preemptively sprayed? Spore traps will blow in. So if, the, if, if you have them in a, in a location where you're getting prevailing winds, you'll catch them come over the fence. Put them in the hot spots to start. Get your canary in a coal mine. I got a quick follow up. So um, I think it was Walt Mahaffey a while ago was talking about do dormant oil applications or dormant applications for a vineyard that may have had a tough season the year prior with scarring on the wood and whatnot. Have you ever done any trials with spore traps to see how effective that is? Because Walt was, he said he liked it, but it wasn't something that would clean things up 100%. And then he said he still had to treat kind of at the same interval as if you didn't spray the dormant application at all. Do you have any insight in that? Not really, I use it, I use it. Um, uh, Lime sulfur and those types of applications are probably the, the best, but if you go with an oil treatment and if you're treating, for, if you're treating the wounds for, um, you type in bot canker, you know, whatever you're using there, that's a dormant application. Typically you're putting oil in that. And if you're gonna go with, with a shot of, if you wanna use oil again at 2%, and if you want to, uh, or maybe use uh, uh, wettable sulfur, um, you're going to do a good job of cleaning it up. And I, I would, I would ask, were they spraying the, were they spraying the trunks, or were they just? Uh, I'd want to see that application. Yeah, I think Michelle Malt and I were actually talking about that last week. And one of the things about dormant is that what we see is that people spray the dormant spray and they're like, okay, so then I'm fine for a while. And so then you put off your first in-season spray a bit and then that's where you can run into problems yeah. too. So you got to think about, okay, just because you're doing a dormant spray doesn't mean that you also don't have to, you know, get started early enough too. Does anybody else yeah. have a question? Oh, yeah. You don't get to scream. I'm bringing this to you, Patrick. Brian, um, if you had a if you had a bad you know mildew season, not say last year, but right, or you have a hot spot, um, you know where you even if you were washing or you were you know you're using a healthy dose of Cal Green, let's say, um, will it show up earlier? Will the spore trap like just go crazy in the next year? You know, have you been able to see that carryover where either you had a client that, ouch, had a problem and then you know, whether they did or didn't do a dormant, let's say they didn't do a dormant, did, you know, is there, could you see anything there? If you have early hits, you're typically gonna have a problem. You're gonna have, you, you have inoculum load there somewhere and, and it, it's sporulating. And this is important too, spore traps don't detect mycelium. So that means you have mycelium, 
the fungus itself growing that is now sporulating early in the season. So you, you didn't clean up your mess. And so you're gonna have this constant spore load in there. Typically where people have had problems, but if I look at it the next year, they're on hyperdrive. <laughs> you know, they're just <laughs> spraying like you wouldn't believe to clean it up. But if, if uh, uh, the, the tell is, what's typical and not typical for your vineyard. If you have early hits, yes, you're gonna have a problem. If you have that stair-stepping stuff, it's a coverage problem. And if people usually get mildew, again, they're, they're, they're on it with both feet and a hammer and a flamethrower and everything else. All right, does that wrap everything? Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everyone, for coming to the sponsors. Um, it's great to see everyone. Don't forget your CE credits. Don't forget to visit the people who came here to sponsor us. And we'll see you soon. Thank you, those of us who join online, too. <laughs>